It's time for Monarchist Minute. Hi, everybody, and a very pleasant evening to you, wherever you may be. I'm Victor Smith. Joining me are the usual cohorts, William Stout, Charles York, Dorf Kilhoon, and our newest regular Prussian Dixie. And we begin with what could have been a foreign policy nightmare. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan this week. And for more on the significance of that, I bring in William Stout. Okay. So, the thing about Pelosi going to Taiwan is, while we haven't specifically abandoned the two, the one China policy, Pelosi or any major government official traveling to Taiwan actually sort of de facto means we're abandoning the one child policy, or at least showing that we- what, One child? You mean one China? <laughs> Yeah, China, not one China. They both have to do with China. I'm sorry. No, no, it, it, it doesn't uh, in this case because Taiwan doesn't have the one child policy because it's other China. But anyway, so by Pelosi going to Taiwan, it could have been a, a um, diplomatic nightmare because of China being the PRC, not the Republic of China, a.k.a. Taiwan. Just say Red China like we used to until they developed their own nukes, and then we started calling them China. <laughs> but yeah, they could have seen it as a delegitimization of their regime, or a legitimization of Taiwan's regime, which, frankly, most nations have a two-China policy anymore, so we should just recognize Taiwan and get on with it, but this could have further intensified hostile relations between the U.S. and China, and now that we see heavy military exercises happening around Taiwan being very reminiscent of Russia's it's just a military exercise before bum-rushing Ukraine, having U.S. political figures in Taiwan is very dangerous, because if one of them gets hurt, and that ends up being provocation to drag us into the war too. Not that the U.S. government hasn't said time and time again that they're more than completely willing to come to the defense of Taiwan. Anyway, mm. the doomsday clock is teetering really, really close to midnight right now. Because there's a very, very good chance that an invasion of Taiwan, especially so long as Pelosi is there, could result in a war between the U.S. and China. I should probably add that China sees a meeting with the Dalai Lama as threatening to their sovereignty, because the Dalai Lama apparently represents Tibet, according to them. I well, he is the uh, head of state of the um, uh, kingdom of Tibet, so he he's the monarch of Tibet. We should be supporting him as monarchists, but not necessarily supporting the United States that supports Tibet, because the United States is a republic. I don't necessarily consider him a monarch. Tibet is more of a theocratic state. He's more like a Pope or... oh, no, he, he he's a very traditional monarch, actually, because he is the Pontificus Maximus of the Tibetan people, um, as well as being their monarch. Um, the typical um, uh, associations you'd see, especially outside of European cultures and that side of the world, was the monarch was head of the both priestly and warrior caste. They filled both a divine and a temporal uh, duty. Um, so in Tibetan Buddhism, the Dalai Lama is the reincarnation of, well, the, all the previous uh, monarchs before him, and he fills that priestly role in committing the sacraments of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, as well as ruling as their absolute monarch. 
And of course, China also has their puppet Dalai Lama, which is only recognized in China by the Chinese. And to put it bluntly, how far China goes, basically just to spit in the eyes of the Tibetan people, China actually has legislation that says you need permission from the Chinese Communist Party to reincarnate. Well, and for, that was specifically written to insult the Tibetans. Well, in fairness, they, I don't know why I'm saying in fairness, they like to do this with everything. Now, taking the actual faith, for example, they've, uh, they, they, they've rewritten the Bible to just completely, like, twist the moral of the story. Like, with the, um, the story of the of the woman caught in adultery where where you know where Christ says he who is without sin cast the first stone and then eventually everybody walks away and and Christ says you know and you know what he said in reality which was because you know the bible's r real uh you know what he said uh neither d has no one condemned you and you know she says no or something then or or has no one condemned you then neither do I condemn you well they changed that to be the law is the, the law and then they and then he has her stoned, or however they, how, however they changed it. Like they, they, they like to. I mean, if they can't outright destroy religion, they're going to make the religion as as watered down as possible and most in line with the party as possible. I mean, it, it, whether it's Catholicism, because because you had because I mean, this is what basically every communist regime tries to do is control religion even and they like they like it if everybody just stopped being religious and acted like atheists like them but they would uh but if they can't do that then they're going to uh try to bring everything under uh their influence like how they uh took a bunch of Ukra like the soviets took a bunch of uh ukrainian catholics and basically forced them and for well not basically they forced them after the war to either uh, they forced the priest to either uh, join under the Russian patriarch or get yeeted off to um, yeeted off to uh, Siberia and a gulag. I mean, I mean that's what the com because because the communists were in charge of the Russian patriarchy at the time. So, uh, you, the communists uh, Charles, do this with everything. They're Charles, all I, got, they're I I have some breaking news related to the story. Oh, oh okay. Uh, from the AP, China has cut off vital U.S. contacts over the visit. China cut off contacts with the United States on vital issues today, which is Friday, including military matters and, uh, matters and crucial climate cooperation. As concerns rose that the communist government's hostile reaction to Nancy Pelosi's Taiwan visit could signal a lasting, more aggressive approach toward its U.S. rival. And well, the cutting of diplomatic ties, the conflict can only escalate from here. Well, this is this oh. is what I don't get. It didn't say full cutting of diplomatic ties. It just said in certain areas, like climate, which is like you do realize that China yeah. lo loves their coal plants because it's like the only because th it's the resource they have in the greatest abundance, right? China would never cut economic ties with the U.S. because that would absolutely destroy their economy. You see, China is very, very knowledgeable about the fact that they are an export-dependent economy, and that's why China somewhat tiptoes as much as possible. Because they know a war with the West would be disastrous for them because their economy, their labor market, and everything that keep, props up their regime is based on their ability to sell goods to Western nations and to first world countries. And, and, and because watching a single video makes me an expert, apparently most of their... Uh, because China, even though they have some of the largest fuel reserves uh, in the world... Uh, or I think maybe the sixth largest uh, of like natural gas and oil or whatever. Uh, they 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 uh, they they they, still, they need way more than they're actually producing, and most of their oil imports come through uh, I think by the straits through the Straits of Malacca, which would be super easy for the U.S. to 
uh, blockade, which is probably why the China, which is probably one of the reasons why the Chinese are going for their whole nine dash line in the South China Sea and also trying to rapidly expand their navy. When you know we have our navy just kind of sitting there collecting dust, and we have some, and we're and we're well, and it looks well, like we're going to be decommissioning it, our carriers faster than we're replacing them. So it's because well we can't actually replace the personnel that leave the various branches of the military, which the Navy is exponentially losing men larger than other branches. So... I conscription! Why... Conscription! Yes, <laughs> yes conscription. <laughs> well, literally, it has been floated around, like, it's just in idea circles within um, uh, various levels of the military that we may have to reactivate conscription if we're to maintain national security. Uh, to if nobody's they have signing to put, because no, it, nobody's signing up for the military anymore because well, yeah, yes, that's what it's, it's for very it's for various reasons mostly due to the political will right now that I doubt that conscription could be brought back in any form um, unless they did a massive PR campaign to promote it that actually would be able to convince people but with the modern internet propaganda campaigns are less effective, especially done explicitly, when well, it's very implicit that propaganda is still very effective in today's world. I mean, some of the... I mean, I, I mean well, two things for me personally. I was... Cons my, my plan after high school was to join the Navy, because in the Navy, you can tell... No, uh, because I guess, you know, the Navy of all th is probably the one I like, uh, and then I guess also kind of bouncing back and forth between... Because if I joined the... Uh, if I joined, if I joined the army, uh, I used to not like. Uh, I used to think I would not be a, want to be a tanker because the concept of being inside that thing would kind of freak me out. Even though I'd probably survive more than regular infantry. But anyways, but then it was sort of like the oh, way that. God. But then I realized that the oath would kind of be conflictory because I would essentially be like, yeah. Uh, and then also the fact that I'd be in, and I don't know. But 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 some of the but the ads that I'm just getting are just some of them i mean some of them are like you know all right or like you the one that others rally behind or whatever and it's like you know do you have these leadership qualities then join the army it's not where they say join the army officer corps but whatever um and then but that some of them are just like there's no way chowda you know and then it's just a bunch of guys and gals in an army uniform uh playing pool and it's like yes i get the camaraderie thing that you want to advertise that in the military there's camaraderie but like do you really think that do you really think that seeing a bunch of which, <laughs> is which that really going to appeal to the conservatives who still think that women shouldn't be fighting on front line roles but okay i mean there's but like, not to oh, mention well, okay the name, okay no 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 let, I, let me speak not, to the army point specifically okay um the so the whole like stereotype that like you you're either a tanker or infantry in the army is Un I wish it was more true than it act than the stereotype implies. Um, but only about one in six personnel are uh, in the combat arms in the current U.S. Army. Which, in a time of war, that would that gap would narrow a lot more. But that's only because of the current state of um a fourth dimensional warfare that we've been fighting, which we may be returning back to a third dimensional war. By the way. Third dimension is like the stereotypical war that people think about, like World War Two, um, or like the war currently going on in Ukraine. Like that's a that's a that's a uh, resemblance of third generation warfare, where it's mass industrial army on armies. Um, while then fourth dimensional is an industrial army against an insurgency force, um, which currently, like we attempted to adapt to it. But in adapting to it, we also shot ourselves in the foot by not preparing for third um, uh, generation warfare either, because third generational warfare is still very much possible and probably probable at this point of happening again. Um, but um, but to, to, fin to Capstone, um, essentially, we flooded the US Army, Marine Corps, etc., with all these support personnel to fill like intelligence communications, logistical roles, and we maintain a small cadre of combat arms um, uh, 
that need to be supported by six other men, essentially, to the ratio, um, if, to fight fourth generational warfare. So, really? yeah, that's... And of course, and I, I was going to bring up, do you really want to go into a branch of the armed forces that calls themselves a global force for good, like the U.S. Navy does? <laughs> The global force for good. I don't know. I mean, before I learned like how the Navy was in terms of the um, uh, their statistics, uh, I don't know. I mean, the Navy. I guess. I guess the maybe it's just because when I got interested in documentaries, I remember the specific documentary. I was like in uh, kindergarten, and my dad was watching. I can't remember the title of it, but it was that it was a History Channel documentary series where you had the two leaders. Well, obviously actors, but two leaders, and they're on a table, and it's like they're doing a war game. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It was that. It was that one. It was that one on the Battle of Midway. So maybe that's why. And maybe the, I don't know. The Navy was the Navy was the most appealing option to me. Uh, but you know. But then again, I don't know. As long as it's not the Air Force, because the Air Force are a bunch of upstarts. I don't know because they're because they wanted because they're like, ooh, we're the ones who get to play with all the nuclear bombs, and they sunk the Navy's idea of a thousand foot aircraft carrier in the 1940s that would be capable of launching strategic bombers. And it's like, how dare you, Air Force? How dare you? I want my thousand foot aircraft carrier in the 1940s. Come on, give it to me. Mm -hmm. well, I wanted to ask Darth a question. Is there any specific reason that you know of that um the Navy is bleeding membership faster than any of the other branches? So, I mean, my rank doesn't prove me to a whole lot of information, but essentially through entropy, I hear a lot of things within the U.S. Army and... We do hear about things from other branches, and essentially from what I've heard, um, uh, the Navy has essentially they've lost um, uh, double the amount of men that they've been able to um, uh, recruit. So just by the basic logic, also hearing the fact that we may be losing, a, that we may be decommissioning several of our ships because of just pure bleeding of the total ranks and you need like every the numbers on the on the tally mark for all those ships um like say i think a destroyer is around 115 men uh, modern aircraft carriers are around 3000 like all those all those bodies are needed and you can't just have like say running at 90% capacity because then you can't properly operate all the systems that the ship is meant to um, uh, use to fill its own role. Um, so like a destroyer is an escort vessel that's meant to um, uh, perpetuate anti-submarine warfare, escort um, uh, larger vessels, provide uh, provide um, sec security, um, uh, provide air security, specifically anti-air security. And has minor anti-ship um, uh, functions with the mar with the modern guided missile destroyer roles. Um, cruisers essentially do the same thing, but more focused towards the anti-ship instead of the anti-submarine and anti uh, anti-air. Frigates are almost exclusively anti-air with minor anti-ship capabilities, but they can't operate all those fancy high-tech systems without all the personnel that they need. So, and if you can't do that, you might as well consolidate your men into what ships you can man, but that means you're going to have to decommission ships. I don't have exact um, uh, ship numbers and um, uh, ship names that I could give on what are being decommissioned because I don't, I'm not privy to that inf information. I just know that it is happening. Hmm. I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of a sad thing, but at the very least, we, I don't know how, what our mothball fleet's like now, but at the end of the war, we came up with a pretty great way of uh, maintaining our ships, which is why, you know, our battleships were still 
from from our fifty at the time fifty year old battleships were able to be brought back into service. So uh, hopefully they're still in good shape if uh, the if the situation turns around. Although I mean, we're not going to be commissioning the Iowas again, sadly. I mean, uh, th- I have seen modern naval theory come out that potentially battleships could be reintroduced in modern naval warfare. Um, I mean, but not so much as battleships, though, but, like, just coastal bombardment vessels, though, because... No, you can't really... no, that actually, like, for naval warfare. Um, I, I've seen I've seen it in places, but I... I'm a... Let's just say it's in the theoretical stage, uh, because it... se- several navies still operate larger warships, like, say, Russia operates currently four battle cruisers. Um, which they're more missile heavy. Like the, if we were to build a modern like battleship to fill that battleship role, it wouldn't be like the World War II stereotype with big sixteen inch guns. It would probably have like one of those turrets, and very packed down with missiles, <laughs> essentially. Um, and it would yeah. fill that fill that massive anti ship role. This is this is sort of the thing with with me and ship classifications. Besides aircraft carrier, all the terms for me at least seem to have shifted over the years. Like frigate, I mean frigate, in, a frigate in the age of sail has nothing to do with a World War II frigate, and those frigates seem to have nothing to do with World War, um, or with I mean with modern frigates. I mean it's sort of like when you get into sci-fi, and then you, you have like oh, and there's a and there's a cruiser. Is it? Does it have the same mission profile as like what we think of as a cruiser? I mean, the mission profiles of these names have changed so much that it doesn't seem... I don't know. It just seems like using the same word to describe something different. I mean, of course... Well, you get different stages of naval warfare. Like, we we don't operate... Like, we don't have gun line ships anymore. And we don't yeah, have so a... So, like... That was an evolution of naval warfare, which evolved out of the trireme era. In fact, they were using triremes up till like the 1600s. Um, like it's only been in recent times have like we've exponentially expanded um uh, naval warfare to what it is today. Like literally, if you were to uh, take a Athenian from 500 BC and put him in. Um, uh, the Crimea in 1600s, he would have been able to operate their triremes, uh, and he would have been familiar with them. That's oh, the, like that's the, like how much naval warfare didn't develop um, uh, that far to that point. Um, well, of course, of course, there were the Spaniards, and they had their ships, but those were uh, those were great corsairing vessels. Um, but still, for naval warfare, the trireme was still what most navies operated at the time well the technology at the time didn't really necessitate need for increasing advances in naval warfare for the most part especially when it came to ranged combat naval warfare you still depended on archers it wasn't really till the invention of cannons and the ability to make cannons that are small enough and efficient enough to be able to be put on ships in large quantities that made naval warfare actually more relevant and in a way drove the tide of innovation forward to improve ships and naval doctrine in the first place yeah um but but essentially you're just like just to try to know know a navy of one period but then try to apply it to like a modern navy, you're going to be coming up short in a lot of places. Although I will admit, from World War One, kind of still set kind of how um, uh, ships are classified today, except for like a modern U.S. guided missile destroyer is far larger than a uh, than a tin can uh, Fleming class. Fleming class, I believe that was our. Mo- main destroyer during world war ii well we uh, had the fletchers and then we lemon had grass? The... um Wait, was it lemon the... grass what not lemon glass what what i no. I, what? I think i think you misheard him yeah you you 
you drastically misheard. Um, uh, oh, <laughs> but, but he, the he was trying to say he's in the class. But but like uh, essentially the role of destroyers from World War One up to today are relatively the same, even though guided modern guided missile destroyers are typically larger than uh than their World War Two counterparts. Uh, same cruisers though, like they they're still roughly the same size as our. Uh, it's typically like a light cruiser back in World War II. That's typically the size of a modern U.S. Uh, Ticonderoga class um, uh, cruiser, except for, of course, without as many guns and doesn't really resemble a traditional cruiser. I uh, think... at least in the... So, like, the, these roles haven't really changed um, since World War II, just they've added extra functions to them. I think... And they've changed the weaponry on it. I think the big thing about navies since partly during World War II, but definitely since the end of World War II, is that Navy stopped being a overall offensive role, and most nations relegated their navies to being more of a support role, especially with the heavy introduction and dominance of aircraft carriers. Navies definitely became more of a um, ground support, or I guess you could say... Well, well, that, that's yeah. that's more that's more of a situation reason, not not really a like. In theory, we could go back to those um, times. Like, remember, like the current the current development of military doctrine is very based on the circumstances that um, uh, we are subjected to. So during the Cold War, it was significantly a land power, the Soviet Union versus a. Uh, which they weren't able to really construct a large navy when they had to defend themselves on land primarily. Unlike the United States, I could sit back and um, uh, occupy the role of, of world hegemon of the seas. So the Soviet Union built mostly a coastal defense navy to fit that purpose, while then their main military doctrine was based around their army and, uh, and air force. But then you get to like potentially war with China and yes China is a large land power as well and they need to maintain a large army but they don't have really any they have a mountain range defending them to the south they have a desert to their north they have jungles to their south there's like China for millennia has been like one of the most defendable countries from foreign attacks um except for typically Mongolia um but but I digress. Like if it was a war between China and the United States, you could see the reintroductions of mass offensive navies again. And even to this day, I mean the U.S. I mean the aircraft carrier just being there is itself a statement. Like even if it's not doing anything, it's sort of a peace peaceable <laughs> offensive <laughs> weapon. And that I, well, it it's meant to perpetuate power. At the end of the day. Because uh, if you can project air power over um, uh, beyond your own borders, you you carry a significant advantage on being able to wage warfare. Uh, and that's why, like, like an aircraft carrier in the U.S. Navy carries more aircraft than a typical nation, like a typical nation that we've been fighting in the last uh, two, three decades would have in an air force. Um, yep. so we can operate these, uh, we can operate typically medium range aircraft from these aircraft carriers, perpetuate our power, um, which they can't operate in an area for long if they're under continuous operations, um, uh, because, you know, fuel and armaments, especially if they're expanding them quickly, so they rotate carriers out, um, uh. Like uh, when I'm going to use actually Russia as example um, during the Syrian war, uh, Russia did fly organic aircraft to Syria from mainland Russia, but that was mostly um, that's not how they perpetuated most of their air force there for a long period of time until later on. But initially, it was their um, uh, Admiral Kuznetsov class carrier, um, which has tough, a, I think. yeah what. You, you know what I mean, but that yeah, carrier, that carrier, um, 
effectively with only 40 aircraft to its complement, and of course you're not having all those aircraft in the sky at once, um, it pretty much relegated the skies over Syria secured for um, uh, Russia's ally, um, uh, the Assad regime, or the uh, or the Republic of Syria specifically. Um, and it was just that small air power that was able to inflict a lot of uh, damage. So, unless you have anti-air capabilities, or if you have a, or if you have an air force that can counter an aircraft carrier, you're you're not going to be denying an aircraft carrier its ability to wreak havoc on a region. Yeah, well, I, I know. I know. I'm kind of looping on myself, but. Or, of course, there's China with their supposedly really powerful land to ship missiles or water. Well, well, well oh, sorry. They're, you're they're, kind of cutting out. Well, I'll, I guess I, I'll take this one if you, if you let me. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, I mean, the thing, with, the thing with that, every single time X development comes against X technology... The designers of the next generation of X tech, you know, every single time X technology comes against Y technology, the designers of the next generation of Y technology will always will usually come up with with something in order to uh, make Y technology survive X technology. I mean, it's it's like when the Egyptians got uh, some I can't remember some anti tank weapon from the Soviets during when the time. What was the war where the Israelis made it all the way to the canal? Uh, whatever yeah. during that war. war. No, I think the six. I can't remember. It was one of it was one of the wars. Um, Israel Israel has a tendency of Israel and the Arabs have a tendency of fighting wars with each other. But anyways, um, yeah, it's they, a, the Soviet. It's, it's been it's a almost well, it's almost like there was a religious conflict that's been going on there for centuries. Yeah. Well, anyways, the, the I mean, everyone was saying, "Oh, it's it's the end of the tank because because this thing can destroy tanks." Well, then everybody started to design newer active protective measures, and people are like, "Oh, the tank is obsolete in Ukraine because because of all these anti um, anti tank rockets or whatever that we've been fueling, or we've been giving to the Ukrainians." Well, I mean, yeah, they're 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 good against tanks, but at the same time. Uh, people will come up with uh, better uh, active protective measures for tanks. I mean, this this is just something that's been happening. The tank will go away when some when you can have something that does the job all the jobs that the tank can do, but better. I mean, that's I mean I mean that's I mean you're not going to replace I mean you're not going to replace an aircraft carrier because at the end of the day. An aircraft carrier is massive, is the only thing that can give that sort of power projection in both just pure aesthetics, because a thousand foot long floating airfield just looks impressive. And that has something, and you know, that actually and is a massive statement on its own that you sent these multi thousand ton thing that's taller than skyscrapers if you stood it upright. Um, and and also from a functionality standpoint, you have nothing that can replace an aircraft carrier. So they're going to design. I mean, th there's going to be some active protection measure, whether it's missiles that are going to shoot down those missiles, which I think the Navy's already working on, or maybe that's what that laser thing is. I mean, there there's going to be something for that. That is what the laser is for. But well, yeah, you mentioned uh... the whole Israel tank thing. I still think the greatest advancement Israel made in tank warfare was the idea of putting a guidance surface-based missile system on an Abrams tank. The mm, they, they they never used Abrams. Yeah, the the, the Israelis had their own. I think the last yeah, tank they, of ours they have is what the M60 or the M48. Yeah, well, that's because they realized that they needed their own native productions of literally everything. Because they, if you're surrounded by potential enemies, you need to be self-sufficient. Um, that's why, well, Intel is a uh, Intel's a Israeli, um, uh, an Israeli company, and they have microchip um, uh, plants in Israel that produce their own microchips in case of uh, no access to anywhere else. 
um, as well as their own domestic tank production, as well as pretty much all their arms, like say the Uzi is a uh, Israeli weapon uh, that, well, is also sold across the world, but is typically used by their uh, special operations forces. Um, and the uh, and the Galil, which uh, I think some versions, uh, one of the parts serves as a uh, as a bottle opener because they just <laughs> because because uh, it's not a war unless you're uh, drinking beer while shooting the enemy. Uh, yeah, um, but but essentially, it's the principle of autarky or national self sufficiency that they go for when being able to perpetuate warfare, and that's why they're. Uh, developing offshore um, uh, ga gas um, uh, because Israel doesn't have any um, land-based um, uh, gas pockets, but they do have technically in their territorial waters uh, natural gas formations off their coast, um, which that's more recent times. But the, the United States, unfortunately, since we've been exporting a lot of our industry, um, we have lost the mass capacity to produce a lot of our uh, war fighting capability domestically in case we were thrown into another industrial war. Like, we used to have two main tank plants back in World War II that produced the majority of uh, the majority of our armor, but now we only have one, and that's in Ohio. Um, so imagine if we were thrown into a war where we're losing tanks like, well, the war in Ukraine levels. Um, I'm sorry, but we couldn't keep up production in that case to maintain the army's needs. Same with a lot of our equipment that's meant to, like, it's expensive and supposedly meant to be survivable, but survivable against a lightly equipped foe that doesn't have a whole lot of anti-armor capabilities. So, uh, yeah. in, oh, and, like, and of course, I, if I remember right, didn't we have to convert a lot of the auto factories into tank factories in World War II? Well, yeah, but I mean that. I mean, but we mm -hmm. have. But even then, we don't really have the capacity to do that now, since we don't really have as many auto factories to. Convert since we don't to. have, we don't have as many factories. Period. Like uh, refrigerator, refrigerator factories were retooled to make ammunition weapons like do we have that ability anymore uh not really like also we don't have as we don't have as much steel production natively anymore either which that's also a major um a war necessity especially if you're going to be mass producing warships um uh and equipment for your armed forces hello pittsburgh well, yeah, but I mean that that all. I mean, you can't just. I mean, the thing. The it takes thing with years all that to rebuild these years. things. Like, yeah, I mean, I mean, you, it's you like need to, uh, oh, sorry. you need to perpetuate a native industry of all these things before a war. Because if you don't have it before you enter a war, that's a massive upstart um, uh, cost right there. Um, that needs to be like centrally planned and focused. Which still, again, like a. Uh, it would take years to do. Like during World War II, like we did have that industry and steel production capacity, uh, but we didn't have as many shipyards as we needed. So we we mass produced the shipyards, able to produce massive warships, and then we started production on the Essex carriers, <laughs> which they took. Uh, like the war technically started in, at the end of forty one, but you could round that up to forty two, and the Essex carriers weren't out till forty four. So effectively, you have a two-year gap there where you're not producing any new mm -hmm. aircraft carriers. Yeah, um, I mean, and, and to, and to, and to Koshyandine's point, yes, we do have a lot of unused factories in the Rust Belt. I got a question for you. How long is it going to take for those particular factories to actually be ready to be operational? That's going to take well, used in a in in and of itself. Well, yeah, I mean, one who lives in the Rust Belt, most of these factories are very very small by modern standards. They've been neglected for decades, if not centuries. These buildings are in no shape to be running in full capacity 
let alone for a war economy. And also the fact that there's really nothing in many of them besides, you know, dust bunnies. I mean, because like, I mean, the factory is, I mean, the factory is just the building. I mean, you need all the machine tools and you need this, that, and the other. And then also, I mean, I mean, it's like, I guess one of the reasons why maybe operating the Iowa's in like perpetuity may have been a bad idea is that if they got hit uh you couldn't just rep- like we we know how to make battleship you know grade armor but there's no foundry in the country that's actually ready to do that so if like if you imagine the iowas were still being used by the military today as direct fire support for land-based troops in the middle east or whatever um and they and it took a hit from a iranian missile or whatever uh yeah you're it would the cost to replace that armor would be ridiculously expensive because the industry just simply didn't exist and that's another thing and that's partly why uh there weren't as many new battleships constructed during world war ii or or you because like you had the british who before the war were laying down like before world war one were laying down like we're laying down four battleships every year and then like last year's battleships were still being fitted out and so you have like you know, four to six to eight or whatever many battleships. And then you have like battle cruisers, which are still a pretty capital investment um, being fitted out. And then you have like the interwar period with the Washington Naval Treaty that just sort of like deleted all that ability and all that industry just kind of died because they weren't getting the orders. And then you see this much reduced uh, capacity to produce Ships which on which that, also another thing on that Washington Naval Treaty, it also uh, alienated the British alliance with the Japanese Empire, which, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Literally, well, Brit- Brit- Britain chose a uh, non-aggression pact with the United States over having a major Pacific ally, um, well, a, a loyal also- ally too. Japan, Japan was very loyal to the United Kingdoms in terms of diplomatic. Uh, um, uh, loyalty. And yeah, it wasn't, lo- it wasn't, oh, sorry. It wasn't so much alienating as so much forcefully ending, like, as as if it couldn't, uh, yeah. But, but when it, the Brit, when the British tried to reapproach the Japanese Empire, like, almost to the night, it was almost 1930s at that time. I think it was like 29, if I remember right. Um, literally, the Japanese Empire said, No, are you going to stab us in the back again, like at Washington? Yeah, that's yeah. I mean the I don't know, Japan. The history of Japan in in that in, in the twentieth century is just sort of uh, when you in, in on so many levels and from so many perspectives and going uh, so many different people. Although, in fairness, the Washington Naval Treaty kind of may have accidentally helped Japan looking at it because they were spending something. I can't remember the statistics, but it was some wild percent of their GDP on the Navy. And, and there were, and, you know, you have all these, uh, and take your stereotypical, and when, um, was it, it wasn't Yamamoto, who was, who was one of the main Japanese admirals, uh, Yamamoto, um, yeah, he was uh, like, yeah, 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 that's, Yamamoto. That's, yeah, Yamamoto, he, I think, but, I think it was Yamamoto who was like, uh, yeah, this whole thing was untenable, because, because the Japanese economy just couldn't sustain the long-term production that they, that they wanted to, uh, so, uh, well, that- mm-hmm. Also, when just on a little side note, Admiral Yamamoto was also when the papacy visited Japan. He was the del he was the delegate that uh, first met the pa- the Pope as a as a Catholic himself. Ooh. Well, that's a really fun fact. Um, I let's let's see. We 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 were discussing Pelosi and Taiwan. Before we run off on this wonderful side tangent, well, of... literally, this, this podcast is all about side tangents. Yes, I mean... <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, so let's see. What do you think? And what, in your opinion, do you think Pelosi's visit to Taiwan was ill-advised? Or uh, I, I think it's our. Like, America has not been participating in real politics for a long time, so, like, I'm not surprised. Like, we've been acting like an ideological state. This is honestly something like Napoleon would have done 
during the. Are we uh, not already an ideological state? Well, we are, but I'm saying like the United States used to at least operate a little bit more under real politics before Woodrow Wilson, um, uh, hmm. <laughs> like like uh, Theodore Roosevelt um. was uh, was actually a vivid ally of the vividly anti-liberal regimes of Europe, like a uh, uh, like Austria and Germany. Um, but then Woodrow Wilson came in and completely scrapped that and went on an ideological foreign policy. Um, but essentially, like, this isn't a good real politics move. It, may, it makes it explicitly clear to any, um, uh, to any nation with basic reason to reason out, okay, this is a clear political statement that they are severing ties with us. Like China, China operates on a very real politics manner. That's why they're they don't really care the type of government in a nation, as as long as they're willing to essentially sign sign pacts, deals, um, military alliances, economic alliances, etc. That's why they can go to Pakistan and Islamist regime and sign a deal with them, but then go to Hungary, a um a, a democratic. Um, a Western government and also sign economic deals because they just don't frankly care. Unlike the United States that will ideologically say we're not going to trade with a nation because you don't align with our ideology or you're not we, willing we can to see, conform to it. We can see this very plainly in Ukraine, actually, because I think Ukraine is liberalizing at breakneck pace. While also banning parties at the same time. Uh, so, <laughs> um, yeah, about that, I remember seeing that um, uh, Zelensky said that um, Ukraine is going to legalize homosexuality or gay marriage, I believe it was. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, <sighs> Russia needs to like level that regime. I yeah. mean, I mean, I mean, Russia isn't exactly uh, Russia isn't exactly the best. Well, I'm not saying Russia's yeah, the like, best, but I'm saying that um, it's. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that Russia's the best. I'm just saying that I, I'm just saying that, that, that something that something that evil needs to be crushed. And I mean, I don't want lives to be lost, but I'm just saying that if no, nah, I mean, I don't know. I don't want lives to be lost, but at the same time, an evil is an evil that needs to be undone. And I'm not saying that's necessarily. I mean, I'm not saying that a war on just that basis is justifiable, but the, and but. Uh, I don't know. You had to. You had to crush evil. Well, in, in I mean, its capacity. It, if we were in a more sane time where we had uh, integralist countries being the norm, I, I would uh, <laughs> very much support a state invading a country that legalized sodomy and uh, dethroning that illegitimate government that would endorse such a sin. I mean, yeah, I guess that, that that's a whole discussion on. On, on the merits and we can, yeah that would be but, a discussion well, for um well, perhaps a, perhaps a more if we were to do a more religious themed show we could well we could get, get into the specifics of that well maybe yeah but I, I mean i don't know i mean the whole the whole thing with ukraine is i don't i don't it's not that i necessarily like once, like I, I've been on record before. Ukraine should be part of glorious Russian Empire, but we don't live in that world right now. But I still think that if there is an opportunity for the Russians to accidentally save the Ukrainians from not themselves but their leadership, then that's the case. Because I don't the the, the prospect of of a nation like Ukraine becoming like horribly liberalized is just terrible because i mean eastern europe as a whole has done a pretty decent job of not being that i mean the north i mean the uh i mean estonia but but they don't count because they're protestants but anyways um well another nordic technically estonia is more of a atheist state they're actually well yeah but they they and they and the latvians were uh were keyword were well they they were all protestant and then they and then they kind of not i mean i mean you can thank the swedes for that one 
I I'm, think, not, I, I'm not thanking the Swedes for that one. I'm going to bonk the Swedes for that one. I think you can <laughs> thank the Soviets more than everything for their massive atheist way. The, the uh, state mandated atheism. Mm. Well, I mean, the Lithuanians. Protestantism is a, is a stage towards that inevitability. Yeah, but, I mean, the. I mean, seriously, do we have to constantly do this? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Unofficial podcast do. rule number one is every episode must have Protestant bashing. No, um, it- I refuse. That is not an official rule, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, That's why I said unofficial rule. <laughs> yeah, sweet. Uh, it was preface it. <laughs> Come on. Um, but uh, Where yeah, were let's we? get back. Let's let's get back on track with uh. Yes. We were talking. We were talking about uh, real politics and how Pelosi is. Uh, well, I mean, she is in the in the various cadre of visible and invisible elite in this current uh, regime. And being such a high prominent figure, like you you don't have to necessarily occupy the office that, um, uh, let's just say, is of that specific um, uh, role. Like, say, a uh, if it was like the Secretary of State, that would technically make more sense. But it also makes sense for Pelosi because she's a good talking piece for the regime. And she carries the weight of having a high place in it, both officially and unofficially, being the House Speaker and high member of the ruling party. Um, It'd be like, imagine if the General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party visited a country, like, in China, by the way, the general secretary wasn't like Stalin, where Stalin was an absolute was had the absolute power being general secretary in China. The general secretary is just head of the party, while then the president is actually grasps the power in China to rule. Um, that's why when you when you go to China, you can actually like know who's in charge. Like you truly know that Xi Jinping is in charge, unlike in the United States, where it's a very decentralized divided command structure that you typically see between various uh, fiefs in this government um but if their general secretary of the chinese communist party visited a country that would be a major uh, diplomatic um uh, overture even if he's not even if he's not in the role of being their foreign minister that would technically do those functions Speaking of general secretary, Xi Jinping is writing his career on possibly taking Taiwan because there's a growing amount of people in the Chinese Communist Party that want to see him out of the job. Well, you always get factions like this happens in every single political party. Like, um, not to I, I hate Godwin's Law, where you always end up talking about Hitler, but I'm going to talk about the NSDAP for a little bit. Um, in the NSDAP, like they, it wasn't just like a Hitler dictatorship. It was of the party. Like he didn't control um, uh, the entire party under his wing. Like there's different factions. Like you had the left, the left branch of the National Socialist Party that was very much run by uh, Rosenberg and uh, and uh, who Goebbels. Well, then you had the right wing. Um, uh, faction of the party that was very much in Goering's camp. Um, Then you also had, like, the more, uh, you had, like, the more national Bolshevik faction that was, and, which split off and formed the Strasserist wing um, after Otto Strasser um, uh, just had too many ideological disagreements with Hitler over what national socialism was to be. So, and you see that in communist parties, too, with, like, uh, the left opposition in the um, uh, United Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which was led by Leon Trotsky, which eventually there was just an absolute purge by the Stalinist faction of the uh, of the Trotskyite faction. Um, and then there was also the right opposition, which I forget who led the right opposition in uh, the Communist Offenberg? Party. No, Stoffenberg was no, no, the SDAP, and he Communist. wasn't a Nazi though. He was no. he was a Catholic. No, I'm, t- I'm talking about the all union Soviet Communist Party oh. of the Soviet Union, which they had oh. a right opposition as well. And I forget who led that one. Was it like Koskin or something? I feel like it was Koskin. I don't know. I, that name just comes familiar to me. 
I would have to. Well, I would have to play through Hoi Four and um, uh, do the <laughs> yeah, right yeah, opposition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Bukharin? Oh, yeah, Bukharin. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, Bukharin, yeah. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, so you always get these factions within any uh, political movement, even in very uh, strict ideological conformity one, like communist parties and like the modern ccp like you could hardly say that they're a true like marx marxist party like they're very much more adopted a very um uh corporatist fascist economic struct way of economics instead of like a tr traditional marxist structure um socially too they're very much embracing a lot more social conservatism now but i wouldn't i wouldn't make the leap to say that they're a that they're a socially conservative party. Um, but they definitely have split from their Maoist routes of cultural revolution to more cultural conservatism slowly. Um, but I think that's just more out of a necessity than out of true ideological change. Yeah, I mean... I mean... What was I going to say? Um, kind of derailed with this side conversation going on in the podcaster chat. But, I don't know, the Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party specifically, all I know about their internal power structure or conflict is is that uh, the former, who was the former one that everyone compares to a frog? Uh, the former oh leader God. of China. Oh, the, the one before Xi? Um, Tai Xiaoping, I believe his name was. Yeah, he and he and Xi Jinping are sort of in this. They're the two leaders of this um, squabble with each other, and I don't really know what the the. I, it's been a minute, so I don't really know what what exactly are there two different competing outlooks for China. I I think Tai Xiaoping is the more like old guard, um, Maoist, um. Uh... Maoist type of the Communist Party, which is still a faction, but it's very diminished, and that's why Tai Xiaoping hasn't taken back the leadership. Um, is because, it's, frankly, the Maoist faction is one of the more unpopular factions within the Communist Party. I um, wonder why. Yeah, it, but Maoist. but uh, steel in everyone's backyard. Every backyard a steel foundry. Every communal farm a desolate wasteland. What do you put? <laughs> but but uh. <laughs> But you but, but essentially get people to death. That tends to leave a bad taste in everyone's mouth. Well, I'm. Just, I mean, I'll play devil's advocate. Mao did uh, essentially pull Stalin and like through through millions of deaths industrialized China. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I, I I hate playing devil's advocate in that case. Um, I, but. Like, yeah, the Mao's faction is very unpopular, but then you get to uh, Xi's faction, which uh, you could kind of say is like the new the new school of the CCP political thought, um, uh, which might as well just be its own party, like a, uh, like a Chinese, I don't know, like left fascist party um, that's trying to take the CCP in a new direction of a national rebirth. Uh, and that's why he wants to finish the uh, Chinese Civil War completely and um, uh, truly unite the Chinese nation like they used to be under, because he believes in a rudimentary form of the mandate of heaven in his worldview. Uh, and he he does view himself as having to rule as a benevolent dictator of the Chinese nation. Um, it's not very communist of him. And of course, well, the Chinese that, that's, communist. That's why I say it's like he might as well like be forming his own like new party that's like a left fascist party and not like a traditional um, uh, Marxist party. The yeah, Chinese communist party has failed to escape a lot of the old Chinese political culture, like such as the thing as the princelings existing, which is a I don't know if you could call them a plutocracy or a pseudo aristocracy, but it's the descendants of the original founders of the Communist Party, and they're still considered important and influential leadership just by the nature of their birth as being 
the family members of the founding or principal members of the original Communist Party. So they're basically a neo-aristocracy within the CCP. Well, oligarchy, because yeah. aristocracy is supposed to be for the good of all. Well, yeah, the... Aristocracy, aristocracy is essentially paired with monarchy, not something well, yeah. like... No, I mean, you, I know, can, I'm just... You can I'm, have I'm, an aristocracy without a monarchy. Yeah, but... I'm using, using uh, Aristotle's to politics, there are six... Well, I don't know. He sort of goes weird back and forth in the book, but there there are six forms of government: uh, monarchy, uh, aristocracy, and polity, and then the three perversions: tyranny, oligarchy, and democracy. So it's you know it's just what it says on the tin. Monarchy monarchy is ruled by one person for the good of all. Aristocracy ruled by a small group of people, usually the rich, for the good of all. And the and polity ruled by uh, a majority for the good of all. And then the perversions of ruled by that number of people, but for only that group's own interest. Which it, which is a which I think is an indictment of the demos, but that is a different topic. That that is a completely different topic. We can get into that maybe next week or in a couple of weeks. Does anyone have any final thoughts on Pelosi and Taiwan and we are politique in China? I I, I have something to say. Okay, go ahead. Lot, so, um, I don't know what everybody's what everybody's gonna say to me about this, but I'm gonna have to say that. I don't disagree with Pelosi going to Taiwan because I do not. I'm gonna, I don't care if this is clear, but I do not like the Chinese Communist Party. I am not going to say I'm saying that there is a legitimate China. I don't think there is because guess what? The Civil War is still going on. In fact, so I, I, I just I support her and her um, going to Taiwan, though. It was a good choice. When I mean, you, you still, I mean, this is not the first time that a um, House of Representatives leader has gone there. Newt Gingrich went there when he was um, Speaker of the House, too. So, I mean, this is not something completely out of the ordinary, but, you know, that's just a big hmm. deal over some. I don't think it needs to be. Uh, I, I, just... guess, I guess we'll go in order of my screen because. <laughs> I just remember all the memes about people saying that if the Chinese shot down Nancy Pelosi's plane, it would be a very controversial topic in the U.S. because the Chinese would have killed an American citizen in an act of aggression. But at the same time, that citizen was Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. So there would be, for lack of better term, very... Conflicted. I'm trying. No, to... there would be, uh, well, yeah, uh, what you're saying is that uh, some people we won't name the uh, we don't name exactly like the groups, but certain people would not actually be upset that she got shot down. They would probably be a bit jubilant about that because how people a lot of people really don't like Nancy Pelosi. Well, but I mean, lightly. I mean, the, I mean, the whole thing is is that when you get to something like that that just that just suggests that your nation is in such a bad way that a, a fair majority of the people would would i mean like you have a bunch of people joking about this which there probably would always be some people joking about that if even if the two parties were just so mildly different in the grand scheme but anyways i mean really that you said but anyways um but i mean the, the that just shows that the fact that a majority of the american population might unironically be okay with with the speaker of the house speaker of the house plane getting shot down with her in it um that just shows that this country ain't exactly presenting a united front like if the like if we went if the chinese went to war with us tomorrow but I mean, like, how do you really think that we would be able to form a united front and put aside our differences, like the French did in World War One, with with their right and left factions? Oh, that was just the Republican. I mean, do you really think we'd be able to actually do that, or or would or would or would it just somehow halfway through descend into a civil war and the Chinese just secure all their objectives and they're like, oh, that was easy. I mean, I mean. 
know. Who knows? Feeling that Nancy Pelosi is going to end up being the Margaret Thatcher of American politics, which she ends up being unanimously hated by everyone by the time she either retires or dies of old age. I don't, I don't, I don't really think you can say that, though, because Margaret Thatcher, from what I've heard, she is known as the most popular and unpopular at the same time Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, whereas Nancy Pelosi is just unpopular. Yeah, I mean, it, Mar- I mean, say what you will about Margaret Thatcher, but at least she was tough, like like metal. Iron, for instance. No, okay, to, <laughs> to borrow a pun from, from that, from overly simplified. I mean, you know, I mean, at least she did something like with the Falklands War and, and you preserved Britain's one of Britain's colonies from from the Argentinians. So I I mean I, I no I mean I highly doubt Nancy Pelosi is going to save Guam. <laughs> Although is there really an equivalent country that has a qu- I don't think there's anyone who really claims Guam. I mean in fairness who wants that? <laughs> um I I mean, technically, uh, the Spaniards claim Guam, and the people of Guam claim Guam, um, which... I mean, the Chinese uh, might at some point so they can get a naval base. I, I, I expect them to actually sign a 99-year lease with the Guamian people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's... Whoa. I mean, they, they, they did that with uh, Sri Lanka. Um, before the coup that recently happened there, which was the cur- coup was also sponsored by, uh, uh, let's just say, the U.S. State Department, uh, the World Economic Forum. Uh, I am in Klaus Schwab. Yeah. Oh, it's the Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum. <laughs> I, am, I am the perfect Bond villain, yeah. Yeah, I even you wear the suit. Eat, yeah, you will eat, you will eat your butt, so you will give me all of your private cars. But does he have? But does he have cart? Yeah, he can't be a James Bond villain without the pet cart. Oh, maybe he does have the cart. We just don't know. Let us well, wait a minute. Home to investigate. <laughs> wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. If we're gonna own nothing and be happy, <laughs> what about the crazy cat women who have like forty cats? Think of the. You see, this is why we can't. This is why we can't all collectively own property. Think of the crazy cat women. <laughs> That's the real argument against communism and collective ownership. You don't need anything <laughs> you know, else. You know, I don't Nothing. think too. Yeah. After what you said, Charles, I don't think Klaus Schwab and the WEF are communists. Rather, they have a weird, weird brand of hyper capitalism. Well, no, 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 okay, no, 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 hold on. That, that's not capitalism, though. Capitalism right. is the freedom of oh, the markets. God. That's they are. They're not capitalists. They're cor- we, at the we, very least, you'd say corporatism. No, no by no, the way, uh, cap- capitalism is state-sponsored usury. Um, you can have a market structure without having userist systems. Capitalism is bent on the uh, implementation of userist-based economics. Money Based generates money. Build. Based yeah, in feudalism well, pilled. Distributist pilled, but uh, yeah. same, uh, same concept. Okay, whatever. Well, yeah, oh. I don't know. I mean, it's, I mean, like, Prussian. I'm gonna, I'm gonna act like I'm super wise and have been in the state for <laughs> 50 years when I was probably unironically a full-on free market capitalist boarding on ANCAP like two years ago, but just pretend I've been okay, in I'll, my... I'll, I want to... No, hold on. I want, I want to make... I'm, I'm I know I'm not saying not, you were an ANCAP. No, 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 no. no. I'm not trying to say... No, just for right now. Just for right now. I am not saying I am completely pro-capital. I am not. I believe more in mixed economics. Saying okay. is that a the idea of the capitalist system good. I mean, a private property, yes, yes, but unfortunately, unrestricted. Uh, unfortunately, the big companies will eventually, by its nature, big companies will form at, that wouldn't be so big on their own, but they'll eventually can gain influence in the state to oh, oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, beat yeah. up but the then, competition. But but then but then it doesn't really be. But then that's 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 and by the that's 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 definition that point, not capitalism. It. Yeah, it's, I know, I know, but I mean. I mean, it, but yes, it, yes, you are correct. Yeah, it, it just leads lead. to yes. that. Yes. I mean, that's yes, I'm not. Yes, you are correct. Yes, yeah. And that's what I was trying to say is that they are they are moving to the corporatist system. Mm. Via it. Well, if, if they if they had a true corporatist system like uh, 
what um, a funny Italian man had, they would uh, actually be having a worker senate, having corporates of workers and experts that were associated with a central political party. That uh, but that's I yeah. don't think that's corporatism. That's more well, like fascist. That's that's that's, that's well, fascist. Well, yeah, no, I mean it's well, that, that's because fascism is based around a. Uh, national syndicalism as an economic yeah, model yeah. which yeah. is also called corporatism yeah corporate i mean actually the word corporation actually entered i think it entered english from the italian and back then it, it was just a synonym for trade unionism it didn't gain its modern hmm. I, I mean actually so i was actually talking to my grandma and explaining to her what fascism was and i was and i was like getting to that and she's like oh like corporations i was like no <laughs> no 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 i mean like no i mean she was using it right because she was using the old definition of of corporation, which was just a synonym for workers' trade union, and I was like, mm-hmm. "Dang, uh, it, good on Grandma for knowing her uh, poli sci." <laughs> glorious, glorious Slovak Americans teach their kids everything. But anyways, mm-hmm. she's she's like, the, I think she's like the only one of my grandparents to be full blooded anything because she's 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 one hundred percent Slovak, and then everyone else is. Yeah, she, she's the only reason I'm a quarter. I know I'm a quarter Slovak. I don't know. I can't say with definitive anything, any other percentage of what I am ethnically. I can't. It's, it's a mess. You could uh, go to Ancestry DNA or my heritage and give them your DNA and they can tell you. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I could, but I think it's more fun just to go through family records but my uncle's already kind of doing that and when he dies i'm going to take over that side also, of the business also what it, it doesn't just matter like the blood is important but also like your soul too so like if you have like a if you have like your slovak soul um uh, that also will matter a lot um a lot more than actually the blood does especially if you read any traditionalist writings they really emphasize the uh the type of soul that you have whether you have like a german soul a french soul Italian soul, just these different perpetuating spirits um, with different characteristics about them. Like a a German um, uh, perpetuating spirit is far different than a French animating spirit. Uh, you can just tell in the ways that their peoples typically function in isolation, and they will typically conform to their own people and their own practices, even implicitly. Yeah, I I honestly I don't know what I am because uh, I don't like per, I mean obviously food preference is a little uh, surface level, but most Slovak foods that I try don't necessarily seem appealing to me like halushki, which uh, well it's more like a dispensation, not like those material things. Yeah, I know that's what I'm saying. It's a little surface level, but um, yeah, yeah let's see, um. Let's see, who hasn't expressed their final thoughts on the Taiwan thing? I guess um, I haven't, but... I mean, I technically... <laughs> I'll go haven't. last. I'll, I'll, I'll pretend to be selfless and go last, even though it really doesn't matter. Well, so humble, Charles. Yeah. Um, so, I'm so humble. We we, this is why we love you. Um, but I technically <laughs> haven't given mine, but I don't have a dog in this fight. Like, technically I do, because it's a U.S. person going to Taiwan. I, um, But, like, in the terms of just purely China and Taiwan, like, Ty- the Republic of China, a.k.a. Taiwan, is not the same um, a Republic of China that was, like, you know, fighting Mao in the war under Chiang Kai-shek. It was actually, like, kind of based. Um... But ever right. since the CIA operation to overthrow Chiang Kai-shek's son um, uh, happened and installed a very uh, gay democratic regime in Taiwan, let's just say I'm not uh, privy to supporting the Taiwanese either. So I, I don't have a dog in the fight. I wash my hands like Pontius Pilate of that. Um... I don't necessarily have an opinion on it. But I believe that we will be forced to have an opinion on it 
Well, not technically forced, but we will... We'll have to make certain. a decision on it all. Yeah, we'll have to make a decision on it if, for some strange reason, anything bad happens to Mrs. Pelosi. Yeah, um... Let's see, Will, did you get to say your final piece? All I gotta say is... Whatever happens with Taiwan... We are going to see whether or not China is fully prepared to risk war with the United States to take Taiwan, or if once again they prove to be a paper dragon that's all bark and no bites. Well, you can just ask. Yeah, sure. Okay, okay, hold on. Will, will you really should have? Will you really should have said there if they're a paper dragon and they'll just fold right over? <laughs> uh, you said it but wrong. Of course oh, we should, right. but of course we should also consider the fact that maybe Biden doesn't want to go to war with China over Taiwan. I mean, uh, which, I mean, I, I, would, I don't. I would hope so, because well, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to see America's sons yeah. die for some. I mean, I'll die for my country, but I, once again, it's like I said when the whole Ukrainian thing started, I'll die for my country, but I don't want to die for some liberal regime. I I don't want to, you know, I mean, I'll die for my country. Uh, I'll die, you know, for liberty in the true Catholic sense. I'll die for the Catholic religion, or at least I, I hope God will give me the grace to do that if, if the time comes, uh, if that time ever comes. But um, I don't, for for that regime, I don't want to. But at the same time, America essentially we're we're guaranteeing the independence of Taiwan, and so from a moral perspective, if we're promising to defend the Taiwanese from from an attack from the communist, then in essence we have that obligation to do that like not even like even not even ignoring like even ignoring the political consequences of no one would ever trust us again like if the british didn't uh help with belgium no, that no one would ever trust them again after that um i mean like, if if no one um i mean even ignoring that i mean if we if we promise a, a people that we're gonna have your back in the event of x and then x happens and we're like yeet uh, then that would just, I mean, that would be the ultimate continuation of American foreign policy, where we to where we promise to do one thing, and then we end up stabbing the people in the back. It's like, don't worry, guys, we'll we'll totally, we'll we'll, we'll totally help you, and then we overthrow your government. And yeah. I mean, every time that we promise to protect a country, we also overthrow the regime that we promise. Um. Uh, that commitment to and replace it with an American wind regime. So that way there's no doubt that they well, are a puppet like Taiwan. I mean, I mean to I mean I I mean apparently in Yemen, uh <laughs> we we overthrew the Yemenese government that we were supporting, uh, who were fighting Al Qaeda. We overthrew we overthrew the president because we thought that his vice would be a better dictator. And so his president, so the former president, allied with the Houthi uh, Houthi rebels, retook the capital and was fighting Al Qaeda. So naturally, we're funding the side. So naturally, we're funding the Saudis who are fighting the people who are fighting Al Qaeda. Because the enemy of my enemy is my enemy, or something, or the friend of my enemy is my friend. I don't. The know. enemy of the my the enemy stupid. of my enemy is my friend. You know, I, I'm I'm making a mockery of that statement because ah. because we're not because we're not if if the enemy of my enemy I don't know the whole thing's a mess Yemen is a mess uh, if you want an actual actual version of where of where I I did that um um uh yeah if you just just look up uh, Freedom Tunes he did a video with uh, was it Jason and the Government um let's see. So we've all said our final piece. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Topic to death. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to move, uh, swap around number two and number three, uh, because admittedly that number, our, our originally scheduled second topic is a little, uh, is a little bit of last week. Um, so let's talk uh, about 
the state primaries, and I will say that I voted. I took part in the great democratic process, and I got out of it the only thing American democracy has to give. The tacky I voted sticker. <laughs> which is well, somewhere... Is it is is it is it just an I voted sticker or is it your your state and it's, the I it's voted the, sticker? It's the it's 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 I voted and then uh, a picture uh, and then Michigan with the American flag proudly waving and the Upper Peninsula is basically ninety percent ah. stars and with like only a little bit of stripe <laughs> yeah, and actually yeah. hold on one two three four You're, five huh. six seven when oh, I um they got the stripes I, I on voted, us up when I, I voted, when I voted, voted in ago, a, for yeah because I voted I voted a while ago in my state's primary we had ours a uh, I think a few years ago. But but I should have taken a picture of mine because uh like in my state it has a problem of well low population density, so you typically only have one person actually running for the seat. Uh so <laughs> every time I saw that on the ballot, I wrote in a different European prince. Like I wrote in uh <laughs> I, I wrote in uh the heir to the German Empire, Prince George Friedrich. I wrote in the heir to the Bavarian throne, um, uh, Prince Franz, and then I also did his brother later on in the ballot, uh, Prince Mox of Bavaria. Uh, I, I wrote in Prin Prince George Ma Mayelovic, or whatever, the Russian what heir. The, yeah. the Russian heir that recently got married, and actually they conceived their first child, which is a son, by the way. Yay! So. Oh, yay! Yeah. Congratulations um, to his Imperial Highness Prince George of Russia. Um What was I gonna and, and uh who else did I write in? Oh I wrote in the Savoy, so the Italian heir. Well, well uh, I wrote which one? Which well, one? Because there's two technically. Oh I wrote in the one that's uh the Duke that was in the United States part time. Um the the, the, the younger the, one. But... Ami Amiedo? Um, Amento, or however the heck I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting. Like it was literally like a month ago that I had did my primary, yeah. um, but it was the younger one that lives occasionally in LA. Um, and then I also wrote in the uh, all three French claimants. <laughs> uh, that, that was fun. Very nice. Very nice. Mm, yeah, I, it, it was it was fun writing in princes for all these seats and making the person counting my ballot uh, have to take just their very names confused. Down. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, wait. Would you actually? You, you wait. You don't have the machine. You actually have to wait. If you do a writing candidate, you have to. Well, no, no, no. But I mean, what, I mean, like, but don't. Once you get the paper ballot and you fill it in, don't you run it through the machine? Oh, and mine. My state doesn't have any machines. Oh, um, and so it's so it's all it's all tab. It's all I, it is, it is like a lot of... It's all paper in my state, um, which is Montana, by the way. So if you want. To vote only on paper, become a resident of Montana. I, yeah, it's kind of different because I know in um in the uh, state of North Washington, Carolina, let's... you're not even allowed to put in write-in candidates or anything like that. You can only vote for the candidates they put on the ballot. That's it, that it's, is honestly, it is it's terrible honestly because the only parties that are legally allowed in North like North Carolina has five parties that are actually legal here. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that again. There are five <laughs> legal parties. That, that people can actually run in North Carolina. You can actually run as independent, I believe. But why? well, um, that, that so you're saying you that so you're saying that uh, uh, Monarchist Party USA when when is when eventually not legal in North Carolina. It is we, not we, legal. we would have we would have to make it legal there. And it is I extremely it hard. Legal. It is extremely hard to get parties legal. The what, Greens, does you have to go the to the state like, legislature? It, no, it has to go through, like, a, you have to get, like, a ton of people to sign off on it. It has to go through all these steps and such. It's terrible. Like, the only parties that are... So in North Carolina, it's um, Republicans and Democrats, obviously. And then the Libertarians, the Greens, and for some reason, the Constitution Party. What the heck, Constitution Party? It's, it, it's, it's a bunch of boomers. Yeah. Ah, run away! Boomers! So Wait, uh, question. You have the primary results up. Yes, I do. I have multiple of them. All right. So <clears throat> the primaries for August the 2nd of the year 2022. The states that had primaries include state of Arizona, state of Kansas, the state of Michigan, where our Yay. great Charles York is from, um, the state of Missouri, and the state of Washington. Now we'll um, go on to Arizona first. So in Arizona, they had kind of a important Republican primary. The Democratic primary wasn't as important, but the Republican primaries were kind of hard fought, especially the governor race. 
Now, the governor GOP primary was bet- was mainly between two candidates: Carrie Lake, who was in- who was endorsed by former President Donald Trump, and then Karen Taylor Robinson, who was endorsed by I think a few different people: um, former Vice President Pence and a bunch of the GOP establishment. Basically, yeah. the establishment had been trying to put all their force behind uh, Taylor Robinson. And as they first began counting ballots, she was winning. But now it has switched, and Lake has taken the lead by roughly uh, three points. Um, and she even, and Carrie Lake has won every single county in the state of Arizona, meaning she's going to be the candidate for governor in the state of Arizona. Um, Wait, was she the Trump one? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Now, um, for the Senate, GOP um, Blake Masters was running. Um, he was the main, he was um, the Trump-endorsed candidate, and the main establishment candidate was thought to have been Mark Branovich, who was the former uh, secretary, I believe. Don't quote me on that, though. The thing is, the results came in, and Branovich got third. Even though polls showed he was, he should have gotten second. Bit of a... A sad showing for Mr. Baranovich there with um, uh, Jim Lamont getting second place and Masters winning by roughly 11 points. Um, I'm going to leave out the rest of that. And then um, for their House primaries, uh, let's see, where is he? Where is he? Where is Paul Gosar? Because I'm pretty sure many people know Representative Paul Gosar of the 9th District. He is known as a very... Um, I guess you could say loud MAGA conservative, I guess you could say, in the House. And, and multiple candidates were running against him. And he won with 66%, beating all of them. And since nobody was running against him, there's no Democratic candidate <laughs> for his seat. He will be running unopposed, meaning he has already won his election. Yay. Congratulations, Congressman Gosar, on your and- successful re-election. Now, we'll wait for Kansas because I wanted, because we're going to get back to them in a minute. Now we're going to move on to the state of Missouri. Now, the state of Missouri only had one primary, and this was between, um, for the Senate. Now, former Senator Roy Blunt um, said he was not going to run for re-election, so it was an open Senate seat. And there was a few different candidates running. Eric Schmidt, who is, I believe, the former um, Attorney General, I believe. Um, and um, uh, Eric Garentens, Ger- I believe, I probably butchered that name, but Eric Garentens was known as being former governor who had to resign due to the fact that he was, he was haddled with multiple scandals, multiple scandals upon this man. And eventually when the polling had been starting, it was a close fought race between both Eric's. And then Donald Trump came out with his endorsement. And Donald Trump stated that he endorsed Eric. <laughs> Which one? He endorsed Eric. Not even Which what one? he said. He endorsed Eric. <laughs> and eventually, oh, he did. Right. He, he said. Did, he did he, said, he endorse he said, all the Erics? There like was every three Eric Erics running. The there was three Erics running on the ballot for the Senate in, in Missouri. Now, oh, Donald Trump this. stated, "I am endorsing Eric. I think he's the best candidate, and it'll be great for the country." It's obviously paraphrasing him, but you get the point. That is a pro gamer move right there. Yeah. And, and um, Eric Schmidt, yeah. aka the former uh, Attorney General, I believe, event won out by beating everyone. And Eric Garentes only got third place with only eighteen point nine, losing to Vicky Harlitzer, a member of the House of Representatives. Hmm. Debating between whether or not Trump was just did that on accident, or if he knew. Oh, he knew. Oh, you know he knew. Yeah, he. I think he. I think he's basically trying to troll the GOP at this he's, point. He, yeah, he, he. You know he. You know he did that. You know. He was. Yeah, he. Now, he I, th- <clears throat> I mean, I don't necessarily like the man, but I could definitely get behind him on that. I don't yeah, care. You gotta, you gotta I just respect, want to see the you gotta Republican respect him for lose. the trolling. You gotta respect him for it. Yeah. I don't. Yeah, I don't care if he wins. I just want to see the main mainstream Republicans lose. He is hilarious. Now, I'm going to move on to the state of Washington, because the state of Washington had two major um, House primaries, I believe. I'm trying to remember if this is correct. Between the 4th District, Dan Newhouse, who was the GOP candidate, or the Republican candidate. Now, he 
had voted to impeach Donald Trump in the second impeachment trial. And many Republicans were going to attempt and primary him out. Sadly, Republicans, I gotta say, you're kind of stupid with this one here. The Republicans, there was multiple candidates running against Dan Newhouse. And in the state of Washington, they have a system of primaries where all, all of the candidates, whether no matter which party, all run in a single primary and the top two candidates go off to the it's national called, election. In, in poli sci, we call it a jungle primary, by the way. Roughly, yeah, roughly a jungle, I think so, yeah. And so due to the fact there were so many Republicans running, it split the vote. And so thus Dan Newhouse won his primary and the Democratic candidate won too. That's so, right. So Republicans, you kind of... But I believe is... Um, I'm not 100% sure if this is the candidate, but I believe Jamie Hura Butler, I believe she was another one who voted to impeach Trump. Give me one second to check. But, um... What you said about the jungle primary, that's exactly why ranked choice voting should be a thing. Not 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 ranked choice, but actually like voting for the party itself. Like so that way we could have a proportional representation. You could like, get more parties in there too. Uh that that'd be pretty great. Cause I really do like the Germans like semi district based, semi proportional base where you still vote for a district based candidate, but you still vote for a party. Well, well, it's 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 literally both. It's called a mixed parliamentary system, which I, I'm not saying that I uh, I necessarily like parliamentary democracy at all. But if you're going to have a parliamentary democracy, you should be you should have, have a good voting system. Yeah, you should be able to have more than two parties. <laughs> now, okay. I found, okay. Yes, I found what I was looking for. So I so yes, the third district of Washington, the incumbent candidate. J Jamie Herrera Butler, she also she voted to impeach Trump. Now, this primary has not been settled yet, as currently Democratic candidate who has been chosen, but there has only been ninety five point seven percent of the vote counted. Also, it's Friday. They finished voting on roughly the end of Tuesday. Well, it really I mean, this one count balance. I'm just gonna say that, but that, 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 that's besides the point. But currently. The GOP candidate has not been has not been chosen yet due to the fact that Butler is only leading by less than 300 votes. Butler. So she, Butler is current is currently leading by less than 300 votes right now. Roughly 250 votes is her lead, which means if enough can if enough votes come in for the other GOP candidate, Joe Kent, she will lose her primary election. Will she? It's really hard to say. It's anyone's game as of this time. As of the time. All right. Next, we will move on to the state of Michigan. <clears throat> now, the state of Michigan had a few different primaries, including their governor primary. Uh, incumbent candidate Gretchen Whitmer ran ran unopposed, so she's gonna go off to the general. Now, the GOP primary in Michigan. This primary has been kind of a crazy one due to the fact that I think roughly three or four candidates were all of a sudden suspended due to the fact they hadn't filled out the proper paperwork, I believe. So, really crazy. So the main, in fact, the main mm, two candidates people that, thought were going to win got tossed out. I wonder if that's legitimate or not, or if there's Who some knows, shenanigans honestly. going I on there. I ain't going to say anything about it, but you, yeah. Now, the candidates, um, the main leading candidate was Tudor Dixon. And she has won the primary with 40.6%, beating, beating um, Kevin Rink by roughly, roughly 20 points. <clears throat> she won every single county, excluding three. Roscommon, Crawford, and Luce. So I don't know if you're near any of those. Now, no, in, now in um, the House primaries for Michigan, there was one major primary that everyone was looking at. And that was the third district's primary. Because of the fact incumbent Peter M Major, I believe, I have not pronounced that right, but he voted to impeach Donald Trump in his second impeachment. And Donald, would you like to give the pronunciation of that name? Um, I don't trust those third district people, so I don't know. Peter Major, and I, I think, think it's it. 
Oh, hold on. Let's see if I recognize this face. Oh, Meyer. Oh, Meyer. Oh, I'm sorry. Meyer. Meyer. Yeah. Meyer. I don't know why oh, I said Beautiful fast food chain. Not fast food chain. Beautiful, beautiful yeah. chain of grocery of, store. Uh, super, yeah, we don't, grocery okay, we store. Don't, we well, don't I mean, have, we don't have gay, those but... in the South, okay? We don't have those in the South. Well, yeah. I mean, that's the only reason Ohio <laughs> could be considered a livable place at all, because sometimes you <laughs> have those outposts of civilization and a beacon of wasteland. Myers is cringe. Kroger's is base. What is wrong with you? The Kroger's is Kroger's base, is though. Kroger's is is opposed to everything we hold dear we as a Midwestern society. Here, well, we all well, well, we all know that Harris Teeter is a superior grocery store. But I have never heard off. of that, and I will firebomb it. <laughs> all right. Well, Peter <laughs> Meyer lost his primary to John Gibbs. Now, this is very unknown how it will play out in the general election due to the fact that gibbs is of course more of a right-wing candidate while meyer was more of a centrist i guess kind of candidate and the district and the third district voted for president biden so that's going to be interesting to see how it plays out in the general <clears throat> finally we move on to our last state the state of kansas now the state uh, of kansas uh, most of the primaries kind of as expected Derek schmidt won the governor primary he will likely beat incumbent governor laura kelly um the senate race Mo jerry moran incumbent won a very crazy democratic primary can uh primary race for the senate though four different candidates kind of split up votes roughly but mark holland he's bound to lose anyways and that's basically the state of kansas not exactly a lot of important stuff really happening in there except Except for one thing that is quite important that we are going to get to now. That was the Kansas Abortion Amendment. I know that's what we've been wanting to get to now. So <clears throat> here we are, gentlemen. The Kansas Abortion Amendment. The state of Kansas voted 59 to 41% on uh, keeping an amendment in the state constitution that um, I believe means that abortion has to be legal by the state's constitution. Ooh. Uh, another state that needs to be uh, totally obliterated by fire, but uh, I digress. Well, the Constitution, is right, right? Well, it, it's the regime over that state um, yeah. uh, that is endorsing such a heinous um, a sin as the murder of children, which we is all, completely intolerable. We all knew the risk of this happening as a result of Roe v. Wade being abolished. We we all knew the risk of what letting states also uh, commit sin, so they need to also be overturned. Yeah, at least with Roe v. Wade being abolished, it's more contained. But mm. we all know that this could possibly happen in some of the more liberal states, backfiring mm. and becoming more fanatic now that there isn't basically any federal blockers either from the democrats or the republicans because there there is no legitimate um uh, government that endorses the murder of children uh do we want to discuss the other primary results nah i mean wasn't didn't somebody say the kansas thing was just, just like weirdly worded though or something of course it yes, it was very yes. weirdly worded. Prussian, do you have the actual I, I text? I think I think I do, but I'm honestly not a hundred percent sure because send me a screenshot of what you have. I'm fine, now, me seriously. All right, uh, send me a screenshot of what you have there. Enough to you. Well, I'm happy about when it comes to primaries is Mark is that Mike DeWine clinched his GOP nomination for governor. No, that's not what I was that's not what I was looking for. Um, I know, I'm trying on. to find out. So Mike DeWine is still the GOP governor candidate, and that makes me happy because the other guy was like I don't know, he was out there. Ah, I found it. I found it. Okay, we're reading. All right. Ballot title. Um, shall the following be adopted? Here's what it says. 22. Regulation of abortion. Because Kansas yeah. value both women and children, the Constitution of the state of Kansas does not require government funding of abortion and does not create or secure a right to abortion. To the extent permitted by the Constitution of the United States, 
The people, through their elected state representatives and state senators, may pass laws regarding abortion included but not limited to laws that account for circumstances of pregnancy resulting from rape or circumstances of uh, or circumstances of necessity to save the life of the mother. Okay, I, what does what does that? I mean, I know, I know, obviously, it's I know how it's you're word supposed, salad. I know it's word salad. See, no, this is this is the problem. Okay, the fact that there are people who are in charge of writing this nonsense is absolutely ridiculous. Okay, so my county had um, two proposals to expand a millage and i didn't vote on either because i don't have property to so the so i would i, I and i can't and so i'm not going to vote for people to you know increase taxes on property that i don't own but um you know, but those they were very longly worded but at least they were clearly worded it was it was this is what these are for this is how much you know like two cents in every thousand dollars of 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 taxable whatever um I don't know if it was strictly land, but whatever. Two thousand dollars untaxable, whatever. Um, y- you know, it was it was long, but it was clear. Shall we increase the taxes to pay for X? Essentially, that that I can't. It's not clear whether or not it's saying can the state government make. It's it's ridiculous. It's it's the, the I mean the people. I mean, there's no legal system currently, as far as I'm aware, to invalidate the results of an election if 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 the if the um, choice was that cl- was clearly that bad. I mean, because if you go around and ask, like, what would be a good sample size for the number of voters? If you go around and ask that a good sample size of what they wanted to do by voting on that, and that doesn't line up with the percentages. Uh, roughly of of how the results turned out, then that's a problem. I mean, I mean this 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 whole whoever wrote that is either intentionally malicious, or or in or they're just or or it made sense to them. <laughs> either either it made sense to them, or uh, yeah. I don't know. That's just. And I think and it's not just ballot measures, it's legislation, too. The average piece of legislation, if the average person cannot read through a piece of legislation in, let's say, Oh, 15 minutes without having to look up what words mean. And sure, having to look up what complicated words mean is part of a job per se. But if you can't get through a piece of legislation in, let's say, 10 to 15 minutes, then the piece of legislation is too long. No, I mean... Well, I mean that that's also partly because um, and, and, and you have to and you have to use clear language too and not use word salad like the Kansas ballot measure. I would say you have to use clear and concise language that the average high school graduate is able to understand clearly. Now, there's something that I think I needs to be said here. It's the fact that Kansas is not a very socially conservative state. Is it a very Republican state? Yes. The state of Kansas is also is but is really very economically right wing. They don't like taxes. That's a very big thing in Kansas. Kansas is not an extremely con- socially conservative state. And that is uh, one the, of the, the reasons why it fails here, party. It's because they <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, um, but uh, they they're they're not a very extremely. There are a lot of social conservatives, like um Senator Roger Marshall is a very conservative person, but the state of Kansas itself is not as extremely conservative state, and really both the ballot measure itself 
And also the fact that Kansas is, of course, just not an extremely socially conservative state. That's one of the main reasons why this measure failed. And I, I, I want to kind of tie it in to the fact that there is other cases that abortion has actually been like um, kept out of state constitutions, like in Louisiana in 2020, when an amendment was put forward during the 2020 election. And this amendment passed, and the amendment itself actually outperformed Donald Trump. More people voted to put the amendment in place, and the amendment itself read, uh, uh, to protect human life, nothing in this constitution shall be constructed to secure or protect a right to abortion or require the funding of abortion. Now that is, sim that is simply written it's very straightforward, and it tells you exactly what it says. And that's what they did in Louisiana. They were straightforward and put it to the point. They didn't do that in Kansas. And, and that measure outperformed Donald Trump. It got 62% of the vote, while Trump only got 58. That was in 2020 during the election. So You remember that Louisiana has a very strong Catholic population. Some of those Catholics might not like Trump but they do like outlawing abortion. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but at the same, at the same time, with the whole Catholics and who should we vote for, I mean, it'd be nice if all of us got together and voted for literally anyone else because 22% of the population, give or take, uh, voting for voting for some for something else outside the main partisan thing would, would be a huge disruption. Um, but, but that's probably not going to happen because of this whole Americanist mindset this, that's been plaguing us since the beginning. And that you must have like a, oh, you must separate, uh, Church religion from politics. So yeah, we, you, we go, we must you, be politically, you, you, we must be politic. we must, we must only have gospel values in the vague sense of whatever that is guiding and, us. And you we, must believe in an abstract I'm deist gonna, God as I'm, well. I'm gonna, I, I, I that really to, has I, no meaning. I need to say something here. I believe, and if you don't agree with me, that's fine, but I'm going to say this. Everyone is religious. Yeah. Every single yeah. person worships something. Even if you are an atheist, you worship something. What is that? Hey, I don't know what it is. Typically, it's a materialistic understanding. Of everyone the world. is religious in their own right. Sometimes a lot of people just don't know it. I mean, I could definitely agree with that sentiment, especially the way, like, some communists and people of socialist ideologies honor their philosophers of their ideology. Because it, it's almost with religious fervor that they honor some of these people. It, it, it almost, well, I, would, I wouldn't say it almost, it, it is religious fervor. Uh, the way that they towed around at their, uh, their great theorists, they might as well be erecting uh sacred monuments to like marx and lenin and i mean they uh, kind of did during the soviet union they erected a ton of giant lenin statues, statues especially put up their pictures and everything you know for a political ideology that's against things like single leadership and great man history and such, they definitely idolize a very few and a very small number of people. Yeah, that's that's oh. why like but but then they, they accuse us of hero worship whenever we point to like great great kings and saints and stuff. But then they don't uh see their own hypocrisy. Like I, I hate the hypocrisy thing because everybody does it and it doesn't really matter. But uh they they also have their own hero worship complex, even if they don't realize it. I mean, no, I mean every. Uh, but we have to uh, we have to acknowledge that we have an atheist in our live text chat saying he doesn't believe in anything. He doesn't believe in well, yeah, God I... at all. Well, yeah, but I mean, worship is just worth-ship. Like, what is of highest worth to you? I mean, I mean, like, if, I mean, that's why you have atheists where they worship the state, because the state is of highest worth to them, or their position in the state. 
I mean, or or the self, or the or or some, or even you know, with with other desires, like you know, uh, I you know, if you're completely obsessed with one hobby, if that's the only thing that you think about, and that's what animates your you know, being as the only reason you do anything, then that's what you worship. Even if it's not physically bowing down and praying to thing, then, uh, well, they, they effectively do that by their intellectuals, uh, running mind games and, uh, around the dialectic and reading the, reading essentially their sacred tomes written by Lenin, Marx, Engels, which, uh, by the way, they they read a lot more than the Commies Manifesto. Like some some like normie cons for those in the audience will just think, oh, they only read the Commies Manifesto and they they sprung their ideas from that. No, most of the time they actually like, lived out their own lives and they actually like, did go through hardship and they developed their ideas organically. Others like the more intellectual ones, like Trotsky, like read of course the Marxist stuff, but he also read like other socialists, like Engels. Um, and and there was other socialist theorists, and they also like studied, of course, other revolutionary movements like the French Revolution and the uh, Paris Commune, etc. And took notes. So, uh, okay. Um, so that uh, was. Uh, where were we? Where where were we? We were on um uh clear legislation. Yeah, we we were on clear legislation. Um, so it it boggles the mind that Congress forces these representatives, uh, representatives in Congress, to read. Bills that are longer than some novels. Uh, most of them are longer than any reasonable book. <laughs> Unless it's yeah. a Tolkien book. I think like Tolkien's works or like Soma Theologica from St. Thomas Aquinas might beat out American legislation. <sighs> like it's just ridiculous. Like I, literally, I, no, literally no other country has such an overbloated system that they produce laws as long as ours. I remember um, seeing this clip of a guy in the Illinois state legislature, and they had just put forward this bill, and they were going to vote on it like like a few minutes after they had just put it forward. And one of the Republican guys got up and spoke about how, like, I'll find the video and I'll post it in the Discord server, but it's hilarious, honestly. But he, he gets really mad about it, and he's like, I can't vote on something that I can't even fully read! Yeah, that's, uh, uh, well, especially if you're a state legislature, depending on the state, like, literally, you only meet, like, once or twice a year. No, I think so, there's only, like, three or four states that have, like, full-blown, legis like, full-time legislatures. I think California and Texas. Pennsylvania so. does. I know Pennsylvania does, because a friend of mine told me. Oh. I, I'm not sure why then, but, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, if you do have a larger population, you do have to keep a more active legislature, unlike North Dakota, where my grandfather was the uh, House Speaker um, for one term, and uh, they only met, like, twice a year. Okay, yeah, so, like, the states that have, like, full time are New York, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and California. Oh, I was wrong about the Texas. I thought they had one. No, they have a hybrid. No, Texas, the Texas legislature oh. only meets like once every, like once a year. That's it. Uh, I wish we could have like uh, even smaller polities like Liechtenstein, where their parliament also only meets like once a year, but uh, they literally vote to get rid of their own power and give it back to the Prince of Liechtenstein. I highly doubt that our elected officials will be voting to do that. Anytime well, yeah, soon. that's because they're an unvirtuous people, so they wouldn't do something as virtuous as that. Um, Unlike the people of Liechtenstein, which are still very devout German Catholics. Fun fact, uh, and I think now we can do one of our bingo card fulfillments. 
Uh, the Jacobitism. Claim, the Jacobite oh, yeah. claim will pass through Liechtenstein upon the death of the aforementioned Franz and Max of Bavaria, because the Jacobite succession follows British succession rules, and of not, course, not Bavaria well, and we follow what the British succession rules were before they changed yes. them in the seventeen hundreds. Well, well, yeah, that. Well, yes, you, technically you're true, but. It's the it's the print, but everybody knows what I mean. Everybody knows what I mean when I say British succession rules. I the larger principle of it. I'm not say I'm not. Um, shall we say I'm not like I'm. I'm trying to. I'm trying to say it in the least amount of words as possible. Okay. But yes, Charles, you are technically correct. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. So, anyways, the, uh, point, the point being that the point being that the, the uh, point being Bavarian that and the Bavarian and Jacobite claims will eventually separate because the Jap because Japanese because the um the the Bavarians rely on absolute male primogeniture, whereas we just have male primogeniture. Another difference between the current British succession rules and and that because they got rid of it's male. male okay, 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 it's. Agnatic cognatic is male preference. Agnatic is male only. I think, uh, though, there should be room for exemptions if, like, say, Prince Mox wanted to change the succession laws, like, technically, as the head of that line, he should be able to. Just saying. Yes. I'm saying it could, but I mean, it's not like, I mean, currently, right right now, Jacobite's main main goal should just be to get, uh, uh, should just be to get King Francis to acknowledge our existence, because. I think there is a better chance of him acknowledging the Jacobite's okay. existence than it is for, than it is for someone to, uh, then for someone to overthrow the CCP and reinstall the Emperor of Time. But yeah, I, I, I which I, is I very know. unlikely. Well, yeah, I know, but history has had stranger turns of events. True, which is true. I mean, like, hey, in my in my alternate timeline, I want to write Karl Marx as a Jewish comedian, like Adam Sandler, except I'm like Adam Sandler; he's actually funny. Yeah. Um, I mean, Adam Sandler just plays Adam Sandler in every single film that he's in. It, well, he's just well, that actor. It's just I mean, a lot like of Sh actors. Shia, Shia LaBeouf before Fury was also like the same way. He only played himself in every single role until he actually like. Funny thing, Shia LaBeouf actually like did sign a contract with the National Guard of California, so that way he could actually like fill the role better. <laughs> In Fury, which is like quasi admirable, but also he's an enlisted man that's like my compatriot, so that's weird too. Yeah, Shia LaBeouf, that dude isn't. There are some screws loose in his head. Hey, he I mean, fits he, in he, with I the mean, California he, Guard. I yeah, mean, also the guy who put a he will not divide us flag up in the middle of nowhere and then. Almost had a mental breakdown when someone managed to find and steal said flag. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he is. I mean, when you see him, you do have to run for your life. It's Shia LaBeouf. He's brandishing an axe. It's Shia LaBeouf. You need to go to the bodies. Actual cannibal, Shia LaBeouf. What I for sport, Shia LaBeouf. I I'm speechless. <laughs> A friend of mine in my scout troop growing up showed me that song while we were adding um. Search and rescue seminar, learning about search and rescue <laughs> on our first aid and stuff. And we were on our lunch break or something, and he showed me that song, and I did not know how to respond to that. Um, I mean, it's important to, for search and rescue. I mean, what if you had to rescue someone who's being attacked by Shia LaBeouf? 
I mean, it's a shy of surprise, I, uh, to be sure. But I, I mean, there's, there's, there may be a gun to your head, and death in his eyes. We had to, we, we senior year, which was this little past year in high school, we had that uh, for Michigan history. We had to do Michigan bands or whatever. We did Tally Hall because the guy in my group really liked Tally Hall, and I couldn't think of um, someone to be a. Uh, and and the guy I wanted to do to, wasn't actually from Michigan. So I so I couldn't do Lee Murdoch, but um, he uh, he so was but the uh, whoever Rick Cantor who's now working for Disney making like Disney <laughs> children's music. So you have a guy who did the Shia LaBeouf song with with such with such child friendly lines as um, brandishing an axe at Shia LaBeouf and there's a gun to your head and death in his eyes, but you could do jujitsu. Anyways, uh. He's he's writing children's songs now, which is just hilarious. But um, let's see. Anyways, he he was from Michigan, so we so even though it wasn't technically Tally Hall doing <laughs> that, we we played. God bless you. We played that. Um, so yeah, that there you go. There's there's your interesting uh, Charles York fun fact for the day. Uh, we I, I and my group played that song, and also the pre and also uh, we had two priests that year. Uh, that this particular priest was teaching freshman theology, but he didn't have an A hour, and he was also a Tally Hall fan, so he just so he got to sit in on that, so because he was like right next door. So that was so yeah, that's fun. He's also he's also kind of traditionalist, and 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 sometimes he'll say mystery fidelium as opposed to just the mystery of faith when he when he says mass. So that's nice. All right. Um, do we have any other comments on Shia LaBeouf? Uh, no. I, I have something to say. Yes. Do it. Just do it. Make your dream true. All right, that's it. All right. Uh, what? Yeah, well, this really... We should probably just change this song to song podcast name to monarchist tangents at this point because <laughs> yeah i don't <laughs> how does this relate to the primaries i mean this is a good mental exercise like trying to figure out how we got from, <laughs> from the primaries hey it's, it's just like a game of like telephone like you'll you'll say banana and somehow you'll get uh murder your mother at the end of the line okay hold on hold on Am I the only person who calls it Chinese whispers? I mean, I, I have heard that, but like more people know it as telephone here in America, so I just use the. What I the can't remember if called. I just learned to say it, call it Chinese whispers on my own, or if I actually, or if actually I was taught that it was called Chinese whispers. I was probably taught telephone, but I'm. I can't be the only one, right? And I I have, but I just still refer to it as telephone if I'm speaking to an American audience. That's what most people know it as. Right. Uh, what the heck? I went AFK for a few minutes. What happened? <laughs> Uh, well, we were finishing up our Shia LaBeouf discussion, and I was commenting about how it's a good mental exercise to try to figure out how we get get to this tangent from the main topic. Uh, and then, and then he said it was a game of telephone, and I commented. Right. And okay. I okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so what were uh, we were discussing the primaries? Uh, does it? Um. So. Uh. Oh, the last thing I heard you say was Adam Sandler, except funny. I'll have you know that Adam Sandler is hilarious in some of his movies, especially Caddyshack. I, I Adam Sandler was in Caddyshack. I I don't know. I don't. Oh, I that might have been Burt. His... Okay, that might have been Burt Reynolds. Okay, I haven't seen his entire filmography. All I've seen is parts of Fifty First Dates, and I'm not impressed. And some other movie. I think one where he was an American football player. Right. Uh, the longest yard. 
It's called the Longest Yard. Uh, is that one where he's from the Southland? I think. No, it's Waterboy. The the Waterboy. Bobby Boucher. Don't... I don't know. It's I, I, like I don't know. I just I don't know. I just and Am Sandler, from what I've seen, he doesn't make me funny. Although I haven't really given him much of a chance. I'm sure he can. I'm sure he's good for a couple of laughs. Adam, you, you should give Adam Sandler a chance. Anyway, let us. Nah. Um, I don't know. So, uh, anyone, anyone want to create a new and exciting tangent on the uh, primary thing, or actually talk about the primaries? A big day for the Trump candidates. Not a good day for the. McConnell, Pence, etc. candidates. That is my thought. That is my one and only final thought. Uh, anyone else? Good. All right. So now we can. Hey, you guys shouldn't be sounding tired. I mean, you're I'm, you're not the one who has to go to work tomorrow. Although I don't have to work ten hours tomorrow, so that's nice. Um. Yeah, yeah. I work ten hour shifts. What are you talking about? I my work condolences. Today is my Saturday. <laughs> I mean, hey, I, I don't know why I get Mondays off, but I can't get Saturdays off. I really should ask if I can flip those because I'd rather take Monday and do deep cleaning than have to work on Saturday after I do this podcast. But anyways, uh, anyways, let's see. So, so we're ready to move on to original topic number two, but now topic number three. Yes. All right. So, what happened was, really, all I wanted to talk about was, um, uh, so Pope Francis, uh, apolog- or, you know, he, he, he did something that do I don't do think he should have done. Did, he, do you mind if I, did you mind if I take it so that I'm not, so that you're not stumbling over your words? No, 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 I, I can, I can, I can do this, I can do this. Okay. Okay. Pope Francis did something he really shouldn't have done, and he apologized for the Catholic Church's part or whatever in the residential school system. And the Canadian government said, "No, we don't accept your apology." Boy, you created the residential school systems. You were the one who created these school systems specifically for the purpose of taking the Indian out of the Indians and gave them and gave the Catholics and the Methodists and the Canadian Anglicans or whatever, all these different schools to run. And you were the one who didn't fund them enough so that when kids did die, because, hey, typhus or not typhus, but out medical disease outbreaks did happen. You were the one who made it so the bodies couldn't either be sent home because of your funding, or the or the schools had to bury them with wooden crosses that would decay over the years because they're not as permanent as stone. You were the ones who helped perpetuate this thing. Okay, and let's not and, and let's not gloss over the church uh, members of the church. Uh, abusing their students at, at some of these residential schools. So let's not gloss over that. I'm not glossing over it. Which was also it. very rare, I yeah, will say. I'm, I, well, I'm yeah, not, it, I'm not well, saying that it didn't happen. I'm just saying that I'm not saying that there weren't cases of abuse where 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 people were like that. But one, that's not reflective of the entire hierarchy of the church or the entire church as a whole. I mean, it's like what people say with the, I mean, that, I mean, it, 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 it was, it's not like that with the Catholics. It's not like that with the Methodists. It's not like that with, I don't know what the Methodists ever have school, had residential schools. Uh, but it's not like that with any of the other uh, Protestant denominations, just because a few people within the hierarchy acted like that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mean that the entire hierarchy is like that to condemn the entire system, to condemn an entire thing based on the actions of a few is is ludicrous um and then this and then the other thing you had to bear in mind is i think but don't don't quote me on this the particular instance that started this whole mess where they thought it was mass graves was a bunch of tree roots when they actually did further investigating um what they what they when they scanned the ground what they thought was originally child graves but but whatever i don't know it's 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 just it's just, it's it's ridiculous. Okay, I don't think that the Pope should have apologized 
because, okay, I mean, it would essentially be like saying that the president of the United States should apologize because of the actions of a few city mayors <laughs> towards a group of people. I mean, do you really, is that, does that really necessitate the enti- the president of the United States on behalf of the entire nation apologizing? Uh, yeah, I would say yes. it's a no, but, uh, it is a, there are people that are legit, there, there, there are the people that actually were abused, they have scars. I know, Some of I'm those not scars saying. scars will never heal. I know, I'm not saying that and there were cases of the abuse. Pope, and hearing the Pope <laughs> apologize uh. is to them, a first step in the long-delayed healing process of recovering from no, 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 no. Okay, okay, look. Okay, if you, if you have been abused by people within the church, okay, I'm sorry that happened to you. I wish I could have prevented it. But the fact remains is that the church didn't do anything wrong. People inside the church did something wrong. The church does not have a p- official policy saying that Indians should be beat. Okay, the church deal ideally, and the church did before the Anglo-Canadian thing got set up. The church dealt with Indians the same way she deals with any other people that aren't Christian. She evangelizes them to make them Christian, which is why. Which is why, you know, you have Catholic Indians, which is why you had Catholic Indians who were Jacobites in 1715 building a fleet to go over and crush hold the on, hand over uh, and, and, we, and we will discuss that on our... Yeah, we can discuss that, we can discuss that for next year's, next year's Culloden special. But, but, but the, but the thing is, but the, but the fact remains, okay, the church's position, the church does not have, if the church had, for whatever reason, which she wouldn't have, but the church had a position where it's like, Indians kind of lame, let's beat them up, stance, then that would be one thing. But the church doesn't have that stance. It was people, it was people in the, it was, when those cases of abuse were individuals within the church hierarchy. Okay, it's not like when America has her position of overthrowing governments that she doesn't like. I mean, that's an official U.S. government position. It's not like one U.S. president did something contrary to American foreign policy by overthrowing a government and replacing it with a U.S.-backed government. This is a, a this is essentially U.S. policy. Okay, we don't have that in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church does never had a position where we are going to put Indians in this kind of where we want to put Indians in as a matter of preference in this kind of school to beat the Indian out of them because the Catholic Church doesn't want to beat the Indian out of them or just they don't want to beat anything. The, the Catholic Church was always fine with allowing cultures to retain go- legitimately good parts of their culture. That's why the Spanish evangelists taught Mexican or Mexican taught Indian pueblos um, Bible stories using using folk dances. You know, I mean, uh, and, it, it, is, and to your point, and to your point, getting back up to the Great White North, this is why Jean Brebeuf, etc., made Christmas carols. Wrote Christmas carols in, uh, what was it, the native Ir- Iroquois language and used things like beaver huts, etc., and in, in the Christmas carols to them. Because that is what they understood. Well, yeah, no, I mean, it's, I mean, it's. And that I mean, is why we have Christmas tr- and the evangelization of the German pagans is why we have Christmas trees. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's the, yeah, I mean, we, we take legitimately good things that can be Christianized and we, and we adopt them and then we discard the legitimately bad stuff, right? We, so we discard the religion, uh, and we discard the parts of the culture that were, uh, that are too infested with that religion, but then we keep the good stuff. I mean, you know, I mean, if, if Catholicism had, had, uh, evangelized Japan and it wasn't crushed, then you know there wouldn't then we then you know the you know uh samurai bushido code wouldn't have 
gone away. It would have just been baptized, metaphorically, of course. And the, you know, parts where a samurai could just kill a peasant for whatever reason uh, would go away and then it would go away. But the concepts of honor and all that would remain. I mean, that I mean, and, and when it comes to the Indians, uh, it's not, you know, the Catholic Church wouldn't have, you know, the Catholic Church wasn't the French weren't telling the Indians to stop their way of life when it came to moving villages or whatever, when the French were over here before the English took over the Plains of Abraham and whatnot. Um, you know, they were just they were just Christianizing them and getting, you know, the, I mean, the, the look, OK, am I saying that every single person in the church was was a saint? No. I'm not saying that every single every single person in the Canadian in in the Canadian Catholic hierarchy, well, that's alliteration for you, Canadian Catholic, um, was was did did their job to the best of their ability and did the right thing. No, I am not saying that they did that. Okay, because there are always going to be some because when you have a church that's okay, the church is the church itself is perfect, but the people within the church might not be because we're all fallen humans. Okay. So, so, so you, 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 you get this situation, um, and it is a bad situation, okay, but the, look, I, not, not to sound, not, okay, not to be too ranting, just, just, just to say just, that if you have been just... abused, I'm sorry, but, 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 but this apology isn't really anything because the church as an institution has nothing to apologize for people within the church have something to apologize for people have that they definitely you know there are some people if people who who have things to apologize for but the church itself doesn't we should probably make mention that to to a person to um let's let's say to the average person that isn't Catholic, the Catholic priest that they may interact with is the church to those people. I because know, he is but the they only have... conduit to the Catholic church that they have. I know, is... but, the, but at the same time, it is important to distinguish between, between representatives of an entity and the entity itself. I mean, okay, case in point, the insurance or the restoration whatever company that's supposed to be fixing our house. A lot of people have had really great experiences with this company, but the but the person who um the but the person who's in charge of our home's restoration because remember I told you we got shot up a few months ago. They still aren't done by the way, and now we've just started to do a lot of the work ourselves. Um when I say we, I'm I'm just assisting at this point because I can't really paint. But, um, I mean, you know, he, the the manager, he he he. I mean, I'm sure he's trying to do to do the right thing and whatnot. But he's he's just selected the worst subcontractors and and people who don't do this, that, and the other, and and all that. Okay, that sour. Now that now it may not be the company he works for. A uh, goal. The company probably doesn't want to, you know, hire bad subcontractors or whatever. But it's and it is, but it's still kind of hard to separate the company from the supervisor or whatever of this project. Okay, so I get that it's hard, but it's a distinction that has to be made because I mean, you know, I mean, I mean. And I know I'm trying to compare a a company that's of course going to, a man made institution versus the church, which is divinely inspired. So that analogy doesn't completely work because the church because a company itself can be flawed, but the church isn't. But the the whole the whole I, I get that people are hurt, okay. And this, but and but it, especially when it comes to priest, because a lot of people probably trusted good old Father Luther there because. Well, he's a priest, so uh, I mean, obviously, what he says must be true. You know, get into that mentality. Um, you know, I mean that. That's. I mean that. I mean it's. It's all. <sighs> but of course, but of course, the the overarching point here is that. I know that people on the left, 
I know that we say if you give the left an inch, they'll take a mile, so we shouldn't even give them that inch. But this particular inch is, but I think somebody made a good point in our text chat. Let's go to that. Uh, but if the instant, but if, but if a member of the institution bears wrong as an exercises their authority as an afford uh, exercises a uh, uh, do wrong in their capacity as authority figures, the institution bears some, I suppose, responsibility. Like let's just well, well, no, 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 no. I get, I get what you're saying, but that's that would be an attack on the divine constitution of the church. I mean, the the fact remains, okay, is that it, it's it's all people failing the institution, not the institution itself. Okay, the Catholic institution, the Catholic Church, is not in any way, shape, or form flawed. The Catholic Church, okay, is in no way, shape, or form flawed in her morals, in her definitions, in her in her in her in her dogmatic practice, in no way is she flawed. Okay, so to claim, so I'm, and I'm not saying that Pope Francis is saying that the church, that the church in that sense is wrong. Okay, but the, but the, um, but but the but I mean the the whole thing. Okay, the whole but the institution bears some responsibility. Okay, that's okay. That that's not the church bearing responsibility in that capacity. That's just the bishops. The that's just the, 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 that, that's the hierarchy within the church. Uh, yes, yeah, so responsibility, think, but not the yeah. concept of bishops themselves, because the bishop is 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 a, is a necessary role. The but wrong the institution contributed to the wrongdoing, and the institution in itself is no. in the wrongdoing because the institution is made up and ran by the people who contribute to the institution, and therefore they are implicit. No, 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 no. I'm, no, what I'm saying is, is that the church institution, her higher, the hierarchy as, as, as what it is with priests and bishops and the pope, okay, that is divinely founded, okay? We had to have bishops, right? You know, we, we have the, okay, you know, Christ made, Christ made the 12 apostles, the bishops, okay, and then he, he made, he made Peter, blessed Peter Pope. Okay, and then and then he, he established the priesthood. He did this. Okay, that the hierarchy in that sense, okay, is there's nothing wrong with it. It's the people within the hierarchy. Individual dioceses may have had bad practice, but the but the concept of of bishops and you can't condemn the concept of bishops or priests or anything like that based on the actions of those bishops or priests because those were divinely founded. Uh, positions, okay. When the higher, okay, I mean, so the institution itself, the church itself, is in no is in no way flawed, okay. It's just the people within it, and maybe the human elements that have been put in over, or maybe the human elements that assist in in that sense because you know there's technically nothing saying that we have to have parish secretaries uh, i mean well we do because of canon law but but i mean there's nothing but canon law in that sense could change okay so church in itself that is infallible it's the faith in itself that's infallible the church and the faith are not ex necessarily the same thing the church is an institution it's no, the Catholic no, faith no they are no, no. because there 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 is two just like how you have a temporal and a spiritual self, the church also has a temporal and spiritual um, uh, self. The church, the church as a in physical institution, is temporal. The church as a spiritual, um, uh, as its spiritual self, is beyond the temporal one. It's yes. like because like everything has both a spiritual and a physical sense to it like yes the physical sense is like walking into a cathedral meeting the bishop in person etc but then the actual um uh, the actual like spirit of the church 
is the is Christ's one true holy Catholic and apostolic church that maintains the traditions given to us by the apostles that were received to them at Pentecost, etc. Well, then still, the Catholic Church did owe an apology because of the Catholic Church... No, 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 no. no. The when people... The, oh, sorry, I'll let you finish. Hold on. ...not to abide and participate in the residential school system. They chose... Of course, they were basically... It was either they participated or somebody else participated. Well, well okay, no, 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 no. We, we don't have to take it to that. Okay, that's the individual bishops as people, as, indiv as individual men who decided to participate. Okay, that's the individual bishops uh, as, as as deciding to participate. Okay, the church as itself, okay, what those bishops did had nothing to do with what Father, uh, I don't know, uh, Father Strauss over in Berlin Father, was doing at the time. Or, fa or Bishop... Or, uh, or, 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 or Bishop, uh, um, you, you, you can just say Father X or Bishop uh, yeah, Y. Bishop, you don't yeah, have to yeah I, I know, I know. Me. Father, Father, Father so and so in Berlin, or Father, uh, or Bishop Strauss in, in, uh, you know, Africa or whatever. That's an, okay. Those are the Canadian hierarchy as people may have failed in that sense, but the institution of bishops and priests and the Pope, which I don't even think the Pope was. I don't think like any of the bishops walked up to the Pope and be like, "Hey, should we do this residential thing?" Um, you know, the the, the divinely founded institutions uh, and and orders and everything of the Church that never failed, that hasn't failed. Okay, you know, I mean, because it did, it can't. The bishops didn't. The concept of bishop. Okay, the what, position okay, of bishop did they, nothing wrong. The, run by the religious orders that aren't exactly that are. Um, I uh, well, weren't these schools run by like the Dominicans, the Franciscans, and not no, by most of them. Most of them are run by Jesuits. With Jesuits, right. by the way, they don't have a they don't have bishops yeah. that they that they uh, necessarily. Uh, own up to besides for the Pope himself. Um, that's that's why they can typically take on those types of things as individuals without having to consult their own bishops in those dioceses, because they just don't view themselves as like needing that uh needing that uh well what's the term I'm looking for? Essentially a mandate Permission. from their bishops. Well yeah, because that's how the because that's how the because that's really how the Jesuits were founded. It's like we we want an order that only answer. I mean, like they're only uh, answers to Saint, the papacy. Um, Saint um, Saint Timothy of uh, Loyola. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, Ignatius. It's Ignatius. Oh, Ignatius. Saint Ignatius of Loyola and, and the other founders of the Jesuits. They just they wanted Francis order Xavier and Saint Francis Xavier, yeah. Saint Aloysius Gonzaga, etc. Yeah, they they wanted an order that specifically answers to the papacy. But, um, yeah, so that's, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess to, I, look, okay, I'm, the, the two, look, and I'm not saying that the Pope is, is necessarily saying the Church is apologizing in that respect, okay, because I don't think he is, um, but, but but I think he means. We should probably we should side. probably deal with what His Holiness actually apologized for. Well, okay, what did he actually say? Because I just went on this massive tangent, and maybe the way he phrased it, I shouldn't have an interpreted as that at all. But that's so. Let's see. So what did he actually say? All right, read the full speech. We got this here from Canada. Let's see. I am going to be reading this verbatim. <clears throat> Madam Governor General, Mr. Prime Minister, dear indigenous peoples of Masquatchi, Masquatchi? I'm going to go with that. Yeah. Sorry. It's hard to and of right. this land of Canada. <clears throat> dear brothers and sisters, I have been waiting to come here and be with you. 
here from this place associated with painful memories, I would like to begin what I consider a penitential pilgrimage. I have come to your native lands to tell you in person of my sorrow, to implore God's forgiveness, healing and reconciliation, to express my closeness and to pray with you and for you. I recall the meetings we had in Rome four months ago. At the time, I was given two pairs of moccasins as a sign of the suffering endured by indigenous children, particularly those who, unfortunately, never came back from residential schools. I was asked to return the moccasins when I came to Canada, and I will do so at the end of these few words, in which I would like to reflect on this symbol, which over the past few months has kept alive my sense of sorrow, indignation, and shame. The memory of those children is indeed painful. It urges us to work to ensure that every child is treated with love, honor, and respect. At the same time, those moccasins also speak of us, or speak to us of a path to follow, a journey that we desire to make together. We want to walk together, to pray together, and to work together, so that the sufferings of the past can lead to a future of justice, healing, and reconciliation. That is why the first part of my pilgrimage among you takes place in this region, which from time immemorial has seen the presence of indigenous peoples. These, land, these are lands that speak to us. They enable us to remember. To remember, brothers and sisters, you have lived on these lands for thousands of years following ways of life that respect the earth which you received as a legacy from past generations and are keeping for those yet to come. You have treated it as a gift of the Creator to be shared with others and to be cherished in harmony with all that exists, in profound fellowship with all living beings. In this way, you learned to foster a sense of family and community and to build social solid bonds between generations, honoring your elders and caring for your little ones. A treasury of sound customs and teachings centered on concern for others, truthfulness, courage and respect, humility, honesty, and practical wisdom. Yet, if those were the first steps taken in these lands, the path of remembrance leads us, sadly, to those that follow. The place where we are gathered renews within me the deep sense of pain and remorse that I have felt in these past months. I think back on the tragic situations that so many of you, your families, and your communities have known of what you shared with me about the suffering you endured in the residential schools. These are traumas that are in some way reawakened whenever the subject comes up. I realize too that our meeting today can bring back old memories and hurts, and that many of you may feel uncomfortable even as I speak. Yet it is right to remember because forgetfulness leads us to indifference. And has been said, the opposite of love is not hatred, it's indifference. And the opposite of life is not death, it's indifference, a quote from Elie Weissel. To remember the devastating experiences that took place in residential schools hurts, angers, causes pain, and yet it is necessary. One quick editorial comment here. Um, I don't know what uh, Ellie Weissel meant by that particular quote. Uh, I, actually, I do know what uh, Ellie Weissel means by that quote. I will continue with Pope Francis. Read on, McGuff. It is necessary to remember how the policy of assimilation and enfranchisement, which also included the residential school system, were devastating for the people of these lands. When the European colonists first arrived here, there was a great opportunity to bring about a fruitful encounter between cultures, traditions, and forms of spirituality. Yet, for the most part, that did not happen. Again, I think back on the stories you told, how the policies of assimilation ended up systematically marginalizing the indigenous peoples, how also through the system of residential schools, your languages and cultures were denigrated and suppressed, how children suffered physical, verbal, 
psychological and spiritual abuse, how they were taken away from their homes at a young age, and how that indelibly affected relationships between parents and children, grandparents and grandchildren. I thank you for making me appreciate this, for telling me about the heavy burdens that you will still bear, for sharing with me these bitter memories. Today I am here in this land that, along with its ancient memories, preserves the scars of still open wounds. I am here because the first step of my penitential pilgrimage among you is that of again asking forgiveness, of telling you once more that I am deeply sorry. Sorry for the ways in which, regrettably, many Christians supported the colonizing mentality of the, excuse me, of the powers that oppress the indigenous people. I am sorry. I ask forgiveness, in particular, for the ways in which many members of the church and of religious communities cooperated, not least through their indifference in projects of cultural destruction and forced assimilation promoted by the governments of that time, which culminated in the system of residential schools. Although Christian charity was not absent, and there were many outstanding instances of devotion and care for children, the overall effects of the policies linked to the residential schools were catastrophic. What our Christian faith tells us is, is that this was a disastrous error, incompatible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is painful to think of how the firm soil of values, language, and culture that made up the authentic identity of your peoples was eroded and that you have continued to pay the price of this. In the face of this deplorable evil, the church kneels before God and implores his forgiveness for the sins of her children. <clears throat> I myself wish to reaffirm this with shame and unambiguously I humbly beg forgiveness of the evil committed by so many Christians against the indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. Dear brothers and sisters, many of you and your representatives have stated that begging pardon is not the end of the matter. I fully agree. That is only the first step, the starting point. I also recognize that, looking to the past, no effort to beg pardon and to seek to repeat the harm done will ever be sufficient, and that looking ahead to the future, no effort must be spared to create a culture able to prevent such situations from happening. Here, Francis is quoting himself. An important part of this process will be to conduct a serious investigation into the facts of what, of what took place in the past and to assist the survivors of the residential school to experience healing from the traumas they suffered. I trust and pray that Christians and civil society in this land may grow in the ability to accept and respect the identity and the experience of the indigenous peoples. It is my hope that concrete ways can be found to make those peoples better known and esteemed so that all may learn to walk together. For my part, I will continue to encourage the efforts of all Catholics to support the, in the indigenous peoples. Sorry. I have done so at various times and occasions through meetings, appeals, and also through the writing of an apostolic exhortation. I realize that all of this will require time and patience. We are speaking of processes that must penetrate hearts. My presence here and the commitment of the Canadian bishops are a testimony to our will to persevere on this path. Dear friends, this pilgrimage is taking place over several days and places far distant from one another. Even so, it will not allow me to accept the many invitations I have received for the centers like Kamloops, Winnipeg, and various places in Saskatchewan, Yukon, and the Northwest Territories. Nonetheless, please know that all of you are in my thoughts and in my prayer. Know that I am aware of the sufferings and traumas, the difficulties and challenges experienced by the indigenous peoples in every region of this country. The words that I speak throughout this penitential journey are meant for every native community in person. I embrace all of you with affection. On the first step of my journey, I've wanted to make space for memory. Here today, I am with you to recall the past, to grieve with you, to bow our heads together in silence and to pray before the graves. Let us allow these moments of silence to help us interiorize our pain. Silence and prayer in the face of evil, 
we pray to the Lord for goodness. In the face of death, we pray to the God of life. Our Lord Jesus Christ took a grave, which seemed the burial place of every hope and dream, leaving behind only sorrow, pain, and resignation, and made a place of rebirth and resurrection, the beginning of a history of new life and universal reconciliation. Our own efforts are not enough to achieve healing and reconciliation. We need God's grace. We need the quiet and powerful wisdom of the Spirit, the tender love of the Comforter. May he bring to fulfillment the deepest expectations of our hearts. May he guide our steps and enable us to advance together on our own journey. And that is the end of the speech. Okay. In most instances, I think that he means... I, he said he said individuals within it, and he said Christians. So, I, okay, I get that. Although his verbiage on the sharing culture thing is just—I mean, the French try. I mean, the French did that. I mean, the sharing spirituality. I mean, Indian spirituality in any sense that isn't compatible with Catholicism needs to be bonked, but uh, needs to be punched down, but 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 the, like, any any form of non-Catholicism. But, I mean, I, I, I mean, it's I mean, it's not as bad as I thought, and, it, and, I, and I and I and I should, and I am sorry for just jumping to be such a quick conclusion with the Pope, because um, and I admit that I should have actually read the thing first before going on, on that long tangent, although what I said stands in the general, when in the general sense. So, yeah, um, if His Holiness sees this, um, I apologize for sort of getting that way. Uh, I highly doubt that His Holiness will actually watch this, but, um, let's actually, let's actually get to the meat of the matter here. The Canadian government set up those residential schools, but Jesuits were running schools in what we now know as Quebec for years before the Canadian government forced the residential school system thing forward. So the Canadian government really has the brunt of the blame for taking those people out of their homes. No, I mean... No, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the Canadian government who set up the system itself. So, I mean, I mean, the main thing I wanted to address with this is the Canadian government. It's the Canadian government. Um, Shin, would you uh, a Prussian? I believe it, you had something. Yeah. No. No. I mean, I don't no, know. I'll I, say it's the I, Canadian I, government. I don't, I don't really know what to say on this, honestly, because I don't. I'll be honest, I kind of zoned out when you were reading it, because I was like, okay, 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 you lost me now. That was a lot to listen to. I mean, I don't really know a lot about what that went on in Canada. All I know is the Catholic Church and a lot of stuff that really shouldn't have happened and tragically happened. But uh. Well, no, I mean, it was it wasn't... We Catholics are the one that gets the they get the brunt of it for some reason because let's face it the Anglo uh, ethos has been essentially Anglo. anti-Catholic for since Henry VIII did the thing yeah. since Henry VIII did the choppy choppy on his wives quote unquote um, yeah, definitely plenty of Protestant churches that were also involved with the well, yeah, that's, well that's what I'm saying but none of them got burned down. I mean, I mean yeah, but, but I, think, it, I, think, it, I think I think that's mainly due to the fact that the Catholic Church was much more of a centralized force, while the Protestants were so much more decentralized. Not, that not the Anglican Church, makes it, which it was makes the it, predominant it, force it, in Canada. It it well makes it easier for the people to just blame the Catholic Church due to the fact that it's so much more centralized than that, the Protestant churches or not. Well, That's... no, not not the Anglican Church. <laughs> they that is predominant in can well, it was predominant at the time of Canada, and was the majority of Protestantism there, which has the same uh, apostolic system as Catholicism because it was essentially a a clean split instead of a rough split. Like, well, well, uh, although there yeah, are but, but I'm saying that now. 
that now it's the blame is of course being shown on the Catholic Church because the fact that it's so much more centralized and at this point the Anglican Church has just kind of faced. I, I, I know you're playing right. devil's advocate, but also yeah, like but... I, I'm saying that also if they're going to be truly um a uh, down to history, they also need to demand apologies from Her Majesty the Queen and her Anglican Church. Oh, they probably will, honestly. You know, well, well, I, I, I doubt know. it though. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean some, they... well, there, there will be some people who will, of course, try to get, uh, or there's some people, I mean, there are people like in a m- multiple um, parts of um, the uh, Caribbean, which uh, said that um, the queen is a colonizer and such and have attempted to uh, throw off the monarchy. I don't remember I where. I just it attempted, is. they did throw off the monarchy yeah, and, um, in Barbados, in Barbados by but, um, Prime and Minister are... Fiat. But, um, but there was, but there was another. There was another country in the Caribbean which attempted to, which the prime minister attempted to, but then he put it to a vote in the country and it got shoved down by like what was like maybe at the very least seven percent. Seven or seventy? Seven percent at the very. That's the very least. I'm pretty sure it's more than that, but I can't remember exactly what the numbers were. It's like seven at the very least, seven points more. Yeah. Um. Well, anyways, I just want to say to start. Uh, the Anglicans lost their apostolic succession because they, when they, 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 they because when they, uh, were, I said, they, I said free... they have an apostolic structure. Oh, okay. I just wanted to make that clear, though, just succession. so there was no succession. Okay. I, was I mean, like, the, the Orthodox are the only ones that schism from Rome that still have their apostolic succession. And the lesser Eastern churches, <clears> but everyone just kind of. Well, they, they, they are also considered in the Orthodox camp, like the, the Ethiopian Orthodox. The Georgian Orthodox, etc. Yeah, I d- different. I don't know, but there's also like different kind of Jacobite. You see, there are two kinds of Jacobites. When I say I'm a Jacobite, I mean in the monarchist sense. There's also a lesser Eastern Church called Jacobites, who who are kicking around. That I don't think they're technically. I don't know. East the lesser Eastern churches are weird, and I don't know much about them. So. I, I just know that they that they that I think most of them, if not all of them, have elements that have returned to communion with Rome. So, yay! I mean, it, er, the Eritrean Orthodox Church, well, is now the Eritrean right of the Catholic Church. Um, recently, uh, came back into communion in twenty fourteen. Yeah, yeah, it was it was it was very recent. I think it was it was definitely established by Pope Francis, though. Although Pope Francis has been around for a long time, actually, I, I think that was under Benedict when Air, when the Eritrean Church came back into communion. I want to say I read it was Francis it an early in his pontificate. Yeah, but, it's, yeah, the date of that doesn't really matter. The point well, is, I think I think Pope Francis came Pope when I was in second or third grade because I remember. <laughs> I remember watching, it was delayed because, you know, Wi-Fi was not what it is now, so it was, like, delayed by, like, you know, eight minutes or whatever, because uh, it kept lagging, but we actually watched it, we actually watched Pope Benedict's uh, re- um, retirement, or, not retirement, but it was, like, leaving the office live, so that was kind of, so that was kind of neat, and I remember uh, the father saying Mass, and he's like, Name he was, and they said Benedict or Pope and they's like oh wait a minute we we have no Pope <laughs> so <when> he, <laughs> that was because he pre- um actually what is a priest supposed to say when he gets that part of the mass when they're when we're in the interim between popes is he just supposed to omit that he just leaves it he just omits it okay okay sweet um dang how long is okay hold on let me just quickly do that when did Pope Francis, when did Pope, when did Pope Francis became Pope? What kind of autofill is that? March two thousand thirteen. So he, he we're, we're he's approaching his uh, t- uh, ten tenth year anniversary, which is his <sighs> yeah. I mean, okay. Like we've, so, we we have we've had like popes that have been the pontiffs for several decades. Yeah, I know, I know but it's it's so, still impressive. I mean, how long? How I mean, long? but but Francis is old. Like, I I honestly uh, wish we'd get like a young, a young pope, um, maybe soon. So that way we could just have like the Queen of England, where 
they're just around forever. Hmm. And it keep it brings stability. Are you saying like the young pope? No. Uh, uh, it will, yeah, no. yeah. Let's get let's get Pius the Thirteenth, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't. I'm more of an I don't urban think Jude Law is available. I don't think Jude Law is available right now. <laughs> no, what, no. What, what, let's let's ask him. Uh, he, <laughs> is uh, he actually, I don't really know anything about that show. So all I know is that all I all I know is that a lot of trads like the first season because they because they HBO or whoever made it thought they were doing a mock. It, it wasn't HBO them. that made it. It actually like they were the one that debuted it, but they didn't actually make. It. It. They just licensed it, oh. um, and like the the trads love it because like they thought that they were trying to deconstruct the Catholic Church uh, that <laughs> studio, but in reality they just made like the the neo reactionary Pope, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then season two they were like, oh no, oh no, we we made a reactionary <laughs> TV show accidentally. We need to back we need to backtrack and make it a subversive show like in season two. Which was mm. called the New Pope, which, like, the Pope Pius the Thirteenth in the show went into a coma at the end of season one. So they're like, yes. "Well, we're just going to elect a new Pontiff," and uh, they the show because they want to deconstruct the papacy. They um, elected a degenerate instead um, in the show, which so, I forget what I forget what his name is. I never watched season two for, because it was like, John, "Oh, John, this is conversion." John John John, John Paul III. Oh, okay. Um, Who reigned yeah, for approximately was, two seconds? I don't know. Like I said, I never read anything about the show. I mean, it was. I was it the old British guy who they claimed converted people to Catholicism from Anglicanism, or am I thinking of somebody else? I, I don't know. I know what season two. Oh. Uh, I don't know. All right. Uh, so. Does anyone have any final thoughts or any any final comments? Um. Well, uh, as podcast leader, I'm I'm good. But who? Oh, Will has something. I said all I needed to say. That's what I was saying. All right. Uh, Darth. Good. Prussian, who who's muted, so I guess he doesn't. Oh, sorry. No, I, I ain't got nothing to say. Okay, Vic, you have a little uh, announcement yes, thingy before do. we do the actual outro proper. Yes, and uh, I, you know, and you'll notice that I did my introduction in a very special way. That is because I wanted to mimic the great baseball announcer Vin Scully, the voice of the Dodgers for sixty-seven years. Born in the Bronx in ninth, uh, born in the Bronx, and uh, I forget what year it was. I'm so sorry. Uh, born in the Bronx, he was 94 years old upon his death, and he was one of the most cherished broadcasters, not just in all of baseball, but in all of sports, and. He left an indelible mark on so many people. If you have a voice of one baseball team for 67 years, you have a voice of generations of those teams' fans. And his impact on baseball is just, I can't overstate it. It's. He is one of the most remarkable people of the 20th century, and I say that without exaggeration. And I'm talking about a sports announcer, not a political figure or a monarch. So rest in peace, Mr. Scully, and Godspeed to your family. All right. Uh, so with that... Uh... Nice little, uh, nice little memorial. Uh, we can do the actual outro. Um, so, if you would like to watch us on, uh, watch or listen to us live, you can uh, join our Discord link in the description below. If you would like to uh, check us out on our various social medias, we also have other links to that in the description below, like Twitter, 
uh, where apparently I've been informed we accidentally started a flame war between Spanish monarchists and Republicans uh, featuring oh, some Carlos. Oh, drop it, drop, drop that. I, I, I know, I was, I was just mentioning that as an aside. Um, let's see, you can also follow us on Gab. Uh, we have a Facebook group. And Wait, if you this would... This is also the first time I'm hearing about that. Like, uh, what? Uh, well, I guess... We'll, we'll we'll talk about it after. Uh, and uh, if you would like to uh, watch Dar's YouTube channel, his link uh, to his channel is in the description below. So with that he being made, said, his last his last video was an excellent tribute to uh, one Czar of the Romanovs. Czar Nicholas II. Yes, Czar Nicholas II. So, thank you. Saint uh, it was Czar a... Nicholas, if you're Orthodox, but also I consider him a saint because. I think, honestly, the apostolic churches should recognize each other's saints. Well, so the right. processes are valid. But anyways, uh, so with that, with that all being said, uh, we will now uh, conclude in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, until next week, may God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America.